oceans cover over 70% of the Earth's surface, so it comes as no surprise that about 50% of the U.S. territory is underwater. We've explored only 5% of oceans. 12 people walked on the moon, but there were only four manned descents to the Mariana Trench, the deepest location on Earth. Pressure is the crucial challenge of going deep into the ocean. At bigger depths, temperatures are extremely low, visibility is zero, and the pressure is so intense, it's harder to send people to the bottom of the ocean than to send them into space. You can't see it, but the pressure of the air pushing down on your body in deeper parts is so big, it feels like more than 100 adult elephants, or 50 jumbo jets, are standing on your head. The pressure is 1,000 times bigger than on the land. Meanwhile, in space, when we pass through the Earth's atmosphere, the pressure drops to zero. We're mapping the planets, but it turns out to be easier than mapping the ocean floor. NASA uses radio waves when exploring space, but this method can't be used for the ocean, since the trillions and trillions of gallons of water get in the way. The Pacific Ocean is becoming smaller, while the Atlantic Ocean is expanding. Many, many years ago, the Atlantic Ocean wasn't even there. It was formed when the North and South American continents separated. Now it's growing bigger at a rate of two inches per year, while the Pacific Ocean is shrinking a bit. Oceans even have their own sound, called a bloop. It's quite loud, low frequency, and pretty spooky sound was detected by scientists back in 1997. Some years later though, other studies revealed that the bloop emanated from an iceberg, cracking away from a glacier. There are lakes and rivers in the ocean depths. It's possible because salt water and hydrogen sulfide make a combination that's much denser than the water surrounding it, which is why lakes and rivers might form and flow right inside the ocean. The world's biggest waterfall, called the Denmark Strait Cataract, is underwater too, in the waters between Iceland and Greenland. It's 11,500 feet tall, and its amount of water is almost 2,000 times bigger than the one Niagara Falls has. This underwater waterfall is possible because cold water is much denser than hot water, so cold water drops into the much warmer Erminger Sea. The longest mountain chain is also hidden in the mysterious underwater world. The Mid-Ocean Ridge is almost 40,000 miles long. People studied only about 1% of this ridge. We know less of this chain than we know about the surface of Mars or Venus. Challenger Deep, the southern part of the Mariana Trench, that's a small valley at an extreme depth of a little bit over 36,000 feet. Imagine putting our tallest mountain, Mount Everest, into the Challenger Deep. 1.2 miles would still remain for the mountain's peak to reach the surface of the water. 94% of all living creatures are aquatic, and almost two-thirds of marine life is still not defined. So new species are being discovered all the time, including those spooky ones like the goblin shark, the fang tooth, and the frilled shark. Imagine what more's been waiting for us down there. There are also treasures hidden down below. Oceans have around 20 million tons of gold, but not in a way it can be extracted or mined with any cost-effective methods. It's dispersed all over the seafloor. If we could take it out, each person on the planet would get about nine pounds of gold. Corals in shallow waters needed to find a way to protect themselves from the sunlight. So they developed some kind of layer that helps them feel good, even when exposed to direct sun rays. Basically, they developed a sort of natural sunscreen. Corals are living creatures. No mouth, eyes, or anything else that could say they're more than a rock, but they are in the category of marine invertebrates. A lot of the oxygen on our planet comes from the ocean. Scientists claim it's about 50 to 80%. The oxygen is produced by marine plants, mostly algae. A tsunami can be up to 100 feet tall, but waves under the surface are even bigger and can reach a height of 800 feet before they collapse. Antarctic fish have proteins inside their bodies that act as some sort of natural antifreeze. These proteins attach to ice crystals and prevent fish from freezing when the water gets too cold. When you place a seashell near your ear, it seems like you hear the sound of waves crashing on some distant beach, like a shell's memories are trapped inside. In reality, the shell amplifies the ambient noise from your current surrounding. There are a million volcanoes in the ocean depths, and 80% of eruptions happen underwater. The jellyfish is one of the oldest aquatic creatures, and their ancestors lived 500 to 700 million years ago. That makes them more than twice as old as the first dinosaurs, since they appeared around 240 million years ago. Sharks have also been around for quite a long time, about 400 million years. Fun fact, 
They don't have bones, but cartilage, the same thing our nose and ears are made of. Their skin is covered in a material that looks more like some sort of teeth than fish scales, dermal denticles. With this, their skin kind of feels like sandpaper, so it helps them be quicker and quieter. The smallest shark, called a dwarf lantern shark, is also one of the tiniest fish in the ocean, since the biggest one ever found was smaller than 8 inches. Lobsters have been around for almost 500 million years. Scientists found fossils of some kind of a huge 7-foot-long lobster, which was one of the biggest animals living at those times. Dolphins are some kind of sleepwalkers, since they sleep with only half of their brain. They close one eye at a time. Sea turtles are quite adaptive animals, and they live on all the continents, except Antarctica. Octopi are incredible marine dwellers. They have blue blood, three hearts, and nine brains. The central one and the other eight brains are distributed among their eight arms. They also can regrow an arm in about 100 days. Sea sponges don't have a head, eyes, a mouth, bones, lungs, a heart, or a brain. But they're still living beings. A seahorse is technically a fish, even though it doesn't look like one. This specific animal has no stomach or teeth. Food goes through its digestive systems really fast, so these animals must eat more or less all the time to stay alive. Seahorses can eat more than 3,000 brine shrimp per day. There's a unique spot in the Pacific Ocean where you're farther from all your problems than in any other place on Earth. It's called Point Nemo, and it's about 1,500 miles away from the closest points of land. It's quite hard to get there. First, it's not a bit of land, so you can't actually see it. Second, even the person who discovered it back in 1992 never visited it. The ocean doesn't get struck by lightning as often as the land does, but when this happens, the results can be way worse than on the ground since water is conductive, so lightning spreads across the ocean really fast. Cold water surrounding your body while swimming may feel refreshing, but that's not a protective layer, and you can still get sunburned. In fact, the water only reflects 10% of UV rays, while the sand reflects an additional 15% of the sun's rays. The temperature in oceans varies. Sometimes you can find water with a temperature of up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, while there are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor too. They release water that goes up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Ouch. There's this thing called the Milky Sea Phenomenon, a stunning scene where the water glows with such incredible light that it looks like it's not from our planet. This area is so big, you can see it shining from space. And the mysterious phenomenon usually can be seen in the Indian Ocean. Sometimes, while chilling on a beach, you can see green flashes over the horizon. That happens because the atmosphere bends sunlight when it's passing through, after which it separates the light into different colors. This is in the same way a prism splits the light into what we later see as small rainbows. Black holes have incredibly strong gravitational force pulling objects in. Even light doesn't have a chance to escape it. A similar thing happens with those found in the oceans. Yes, no need to go to space to see one of those. We have them on Earth too. It's just that they don't catch the light, but the water. They are enormous whirlpools, sometimes bigger than whole cities. And they're spinning against the main current, swirling billions of tons of water and everything else on the way. Imagine a world where instead of water, the oceans are made of methane. Yeah, that's right. Instead of swimming in H2O, you'd be paddling around in CH4. It's like Mother Nature's version of a fizzy drink. Such oceans actually exist on one of Saturn's moons called Titan. In fact, the methane and ethane on Titan play a similar role to the water on Earth. They cycle through the atmosphere and form clouds that eventually rain down onto the surface. They were discovered by the Cassini-Huygens space probe. And apparently, our entire planet's oil reserves could fit in one of Titan's puddles. Even the desert sand dunes on Titan have more organics than all of Earth's coal reserves. Who knew that Titan was the place to go if you're ever in need of fuel for your car? Now, obviously, there are some things that distinguish methane lakes from our water ones. First, the temperature on Titan is around negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like taking a dip in a giant glass of liquid nitrogen. Not exactly ideal for a beach day, is it? Methane is also less dense than water. So if you were to go swimming in such an ocean, you'd float like a balloon. On the bright side, 
it would make doing the backstroke a lot easier. Next, while water waves can be pretty majestic, unfortunately, we can't ride any on Titan. Cassini didn't detect any big waves there. Maybe it's due to low seasonal winds, or the fact that some of the lakes are much smaller than Earth's lakes, but we don't know for sure. Also, I know what you're thinking. If the oceans are made of methane, could you set them on fire? Technically, yes. Methane is a highly flammable gas, so if you were to light a match in a methane ocean, you'd get a pretty impressive, but dangerous, blaze. So, given all these differences, the question arises, what would a planet with such oceans look like? Well, we can make some guesses by looking at Titan. First of all, its atmosphere, composed primarily of methane, would be incredibly thick. Titan's atmosphere reaches nearly 370 miles into space, and the atmospheric pressure there is 60% greater than Earth's. So, if you ever wanted to experience the feeling of swimming super deep in the ocean, now's your chance. Also, methane is a powerful greenhouse gas that traps the sun's heat really well. That's why our planet would warm up faster than a sauna. You may ask, why is it so cold on Titan then? This is because this moon is very far from the sun, and light doesn't reach it well. But if we place our planet somewhere in the middle, then the temperature may even be quite comfortable. Actually, methane oceans on a planet could really spice up the climate. The planet would be a breeding ground for methane clouds. Just like on Titan, it could form an orange-colored haze, or smog, that would make our planet look like a real mystery. It would be difficult to see us from space without some special telescopes. And let's not forget about methane storms. They would also occasionally drench the surface, so remember to bring your umbrella. But hey, at least the heavy, carbon-rich compounds would make for some pretty sweet dune fields. And finally, the most important difference. While water oceans on Earth are teeming with all sorts of creatures, we're not sure if there's any life in methane oceans on Titan. If there is, they'd have to be pretty tough to survive in such extreme conditions. So, if life on such a planet exists, it would be very different from what we're used to seeing on Earth. For example, microbes might be able to handle it. These tiny resilient creatures can survive in a wide range of environments, including extreme ones. So, it's possible that microbial life could exist in methane oceans. And what about us and animals? Well, scientist Robert Zubrin thinks that Titan might be the perfect place for humans to colonize in our solar system. According to him, this little moon has everything we need to survive and thrive. And if it's possible on that moon, then it could work with a planet too. For starters, we'd need some oxygen to breathe. We could use nitrogen and methane in the atmosphere to create breathable air and rocket fuel. We could also use these elements to make some fertilizers and grow plants. Next up, we'd need water. Since the oceans are made of methane, we can't exactly drink them. We'd need to find or create sources of water. Scientists believe that it actually may be hidden below the surface on Titan, together with some ammonia. We could use it to drink, or create even more oxygen. So, with all of these resources, we could create a self-sustaining colony even in a place with methane oceans. Piece of cake! Although, there are always alternatives. Maybe we could become methane breathers, evolve into organisms that use methane instead of oxygen. For example, we could get some large lungs because we'd have to inhale a much larger volume of air, since methane is less dense than oxygen. But this is pure sci-fi. Methane oceans are not the only unusual oceans in space. It turns out that seas on diamond planets may be even weirder. Take WASP-12b, for example. This exoplanet, located about 1,200 light-years away, might have oceans of tar. That's right, tar. The planet has more carbon than oxygen, which means its crust is probably made of things like diamond and graphite, 
instead of your average silica-based minerals like granite. Imagine stepping on this planet, and the first thing you notice is that the beaches are made up of black goo. It's like stepping into a nightmare, where you're trapped in quicksand made of sticky sludge. So forget about the sandy beaches and crystal clear water you're used to. Here, you'll be living the pitch life. Your swimwear will be replaced with hazmat suits, and you'll need a sturdy pair of boots to walk on the sticky surface. But in reality, WASP-12b is not the place to look for geology of any kind. It's simply too hot for anything to survive, let alone thrive. But there might be smaller, similar exoplanets where we could potentially live. Now, you might be thinking, tar oceans? Eh, that's crazy talk. But did you know that there's a 246-foot deep lake of natural asphalt here on Earth? It's called Pitch Lake, and it's located in Trinidad. It's formed when oil is forced to the surface, and the lighter components evaporate, leaving the thicker, heavier pitch behind. And guess what? This lake is home to a thriving ecosystem of microbes. So if you want to live on such a planet, at least you won't be alone. You'll have plenty of company in bacteria, fungi that love to feast on carbon found in asphalt, and archaea that live on methane. And finally, there are oceans of molten rock. That's right. Imagine a world where the floor is lava isn't just a game, but a reality. Welcome to 55 Cancri E, a planet so hot that the entire hemisphere facing its star is covered in magma. It's like a scene out of a heavy metal album cover. But don't worry, the other side of the planet is slightly cooler, so you can at least step off the lava and catch your breath. If you're feeling adventurous, you could always hop over to Koro T7b, another super-Earth where the lava ocean is just a scorching. But this time, the night side doesn't offer much respite either. It's still seeing constant volcanic eruptions, like some sort of fireworks show. Scientists are scratching their heads trying to explain why these planets are so hot, and why they haven't cooled down yet. Maybe they're just really good at retaining heat, or maybe they just have a bad temperament. Either way, it's probably best to stick to playing the floor is lava on solid ground and leave the real lava planets to someone else. All this diversity of oceans shows us that the universe is always full of surprises. It never ceases to amaze us with its creativity. Although these oceans are not suitable for human exploration, yet, they challenge our understanding of what could exist beyond our world. So, let's continue to explore. The Baltic Sea Anomaly. In 2011, a diving team came down to the bottom of the northern part of the Baltic Sea. They went on a treasure hunt. But what they came upon was a pretty weird object. When they took photos and showed them to others, many believed it was a sunken spaceship of another civilization. Other people thought that some natural causes formed the object, but the metals inside the structure definitely couldn't have been formed naturally. Now, some scientists even believe it was something that appeared way back in the Ice Age. Maybe it was even a meteorite that ended up trapped under ice back then. A maelstrom is a whirlpool, some sort of a powerful rotational current that forms when two currents collide and create a circular vortex. Even fearless Vikings were afraid of maelstroms because those were forces so powerful that they could sink large ships. These whirlpools remain dangerous even today. But luckily, not for big modern ships that are large enough to withstand the power of maelstroms. But a cruise ship that gets into a maelstrom usually faces massive waves that can rock even big vessels from side to side pretty intensely. A maelstrom can be so strong, it can turn into some sort of an underwater black hole. Yep, black holes are not only present in the cold expanse of space, you can find them here on our home planet too, swirling in the oceans. They're similar to those in space, since they're compacted so tightly that nothing they trap can escape. 
underwater black holes often span up to 93 miles in diameter. And if you got into one of those, you probably wouldn't even know it. These black holes act like vortices, but because of their size, even professionals can hardly see their boundaries. Here's something relaxing. Next time you go to the beach, pay attention, and maybe you'll see an optical phenomenon called the green flash. You can see it shortly after sunset or right before sunrise. It occurs when the sun is almost completely below the horizon, while its rim, the upper one, is still visible. For just a second or two, that upper edge of the sun will appear green. It's because you're looking at the sun through thicker parts of the atmosphere as it's moving down in the sky. As it's dipping below the horizon, light refracts, or bends, in the atmosphere and gets dispersed. Wait for a clear day with no clouds or haze on the horizon to see this phenomenon better. You've been looking forward to a nice swim, only to realize that the water in the ocean is red? Better avoid going in. Florida is known for its red tides. It occurs when the concentration of specific microscopic algae is higher than normal. Thousands of species of algae in marine and fresh waters are mostly harmless to animals and humans. They even help us, since they're an important source of oxygen. But some, like the algae that makes the ocean red, can be extremely dangerous for marine animals, like sea turtles, fish, and seabirds. This kind can grow out of control and produce neurotoxins harmful to humans, especially those who have some respiratory issues. Such people should avoid red tide areas, especially when winds are strong enough to push the algae toward the shore. Volcanoes can spew poisonous gas, ash, and red-hot lava. Those are the most obvious dangers most of us already know about. But submarine volcanoes can be very tricky in their own way. Sometimes, when they're located in shallow waters, they reveal their presence by blasting debris of rock and steam high above the surface. Since submarine volcanoes are surrounded by an unlimited supply of water, they can behave differently from those on land. When they erupt, seawater gets into active submarine vents. Lava can be spreading across a shallow sea floor, or sometimes even flowing into the sea from land volcanoes. When in water, it may cool down so quickly that it shatters into rubble and sand. So, there are large amounts of volcanic debris left there. You know those popular black sand beaches in Hawaii? That's how they formed. Hot lava and powerful eruptions certainly don't sound safe. But submarine volcanoes in deeper waters are equally dangerous. Even though they're not necessarily erupting, they produce pockets of bubbles. These bubbles reduce the density of the surrounding waters, which can even sink ships. The worst thing is that when you look at the surface of the ocean, you can't understand something's wrong. But at the same time, tiny bubbles are there, causing ships to lose buoyancy and with very little warning. A cross sea is a rare phenomenon, beautiful to observe, but also very dangerous. It's when you see square waves, which are more common in shallow parts of the ocean. That's something you can often see in France or on certain beaches of Tel Aviv. But it can also happen in many coastal areas across the world. A cross sea occurs when two wave patterns travel at oblique angles. They form this checkerboard-like pattern. It mostly happens when two swells meet, or when a swell pushes waves in one direction while a strong wind pushes them in another. These square waves can be dangerous for swimmers and boaters. The waves produced by strong ocean currents can be pretty unpredictable and tall, sometimes up to almost 10 feet. This phenomenon is sometimes called white walls. These waves can be so powerful that they can turn over even big boats. If you fill a clear glass with some ocean water and take a closer look, you'll see it's full of very small particles. Seawater contains dissolved salts, fats, algae, proteins, detergents, and other bits of artificial and organic matter. If you shake that glass, you'll see tiny bubbles forming on its surface. 
That's how seafoam forms when waves and winds agitate the ocean. When you see thick seafoam, algal blooms might have caused it. When big blooms of algae fall apart in the sea, large amounts of that matter move in the direction of dry land. Most kinds of seafoam aren't dangerous to humans, but when blooms of algae fall apart, it can have a negative impact on both the environment and people. For example, when seafoam bubbles pop, the toxins they contain get released into the air, and they can irritate your eyes or cause some other health issues. You can see a tidal bore in the areas where a river empties into a sea or an ocean. It's a powerful tide that goes against the current and pushes up the river. A tidal bore falls into a category of something called the surge, which is a sudden change in depth. A tidal bore is a positive surge, which means it pushes up a river, making it much deeper. A negative surge is when the river suddenly becomes very shallow. You won't see tidal bores everywhere. The river must be fairly shallow with a narrow outlet to the sea. The place where the sea and the river meet must be flat and wide. Also, the area between low and high tide must be at least 20 feet across. Of course, there are some exceptions, like the Amazon River, the world's largest one. The mouth of the Amazon is not narrow, but the river experiences tidal bores. That's because its mouth is shallow and has many sandbars and low-lying islands. The tidal bore is so strong there that the river doesn't even have a delta. Its sediment goes directly into the Atlantic Ocean, where fast-moving currents take it away. A tidal bore is often unpredictable and can be extremely rough. In many cases, it changes the color of the river from greenish or blue to brown. It can damage vegetation or even tear trees out of the ground. So, recreation sports like kayaking and river surfing can be hazardous in these areas. Even if you just want to take a look at a tidal bore, be careful. Tidal waves can sweep over lookout points and drag whatever or whoever is there into the churning river. The ocean is turning red hot. You try to get closer for a better look, but you start feeling the air getting hotter and hotter, like reaching into an oven. And the sand is so hot that your rubber slippers start melting. The oceans somehow turned into steamy, hot, gooey lava. You start running inland and see a frenzy of people running wild. See, in reality, lava is made of molten rocks from below the Earth's surface. Deep inside our planet, like the distance between New York and Philadelphia deep, the underground heat from the core melts rocks the same way the sun melts ice cream. When these rocks melt, their temperatures can reach around 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. But don't worry, that only happens really deep under the ground, and only in some specific areas, mostly around the Atlantic Ocean. And it only pops out of the ground when there's so much pressure that it flows up to the surface as a gooey orange super hot liquid called lava that usually erupts through a volcano's neck. But somehow, the entire ocean is made of lava now. And although from a really far away distance, it looks pretty cool to look at, it's really dangerous. First of all, say goodbye to the beautiful blue waves and the ocean currents. Unlike water, lava is thicker, closer to creamy peanut butter in texture, so the wind can't move it around like it used to. But that also means that nothing can sink or swim in it. So even if some ocean creatures could withstand the super high temperatures of lava, they won't be able to live inside of it. They'll either be submerged or float on the surface instead, depending on their density. So, all our marine friends and other creatures that used to call the ocean home will need to find another body of water to live in if they want to survive. Actually, the only animals on this planet that could possibly survive the heat of lava would be the tardigrades. These cute microscopic creatures can survive in any extreme environment on this planet. From frozen icy glaciers to hot and fiery volcanoes, they can even survive in outer space under the cosmic rays. You run away from the beach along with everyone else nearby. The atmosphere is getting thicker and it's not easy to see around you. You think to yourself, I should have stayed home. But home isn't exactly safe either. 
The heat radiating from all the lava alone would be intolerable for miles. So no more houses by the sea and beach resorts. You're going to want to make sure you live as far away from the ocean as possible. Most of the coastal cities would become instantly uninhabitable, especially areas touching the ocean with more than one side. Places like Florida, California, and Central America would become mostly unbearable to live in. And that's not to mention island life. Most islands would be so hot that no animal or plant could survive. 97% of the planet was made up of ocean water, and it now all turned to lava. No place on Earth can hold snow anymore, as the planet would look like a glowing orange lava ball. Temperatures would rise so much that the furthest place from the shores and even the highest peaks will still feel like the hottest day in a desert. As you keep running away from the ocean, you realize that maybe you're dreaming. But you look at your skin and see so much redness. Even if you run for miles, the heat will still catch up to you. All the offshore oil rigs and ships in the middle of the oceans will face plenty of problems too. Their metallic composition would simply glow red and melt instantly when in contact with hot lava. And even if it doesn't melt, you better hope nobody happens to be on it. But in any event like that, they would have evacuated everyone. Meanwhile, at the North and South Poles, where the planet is at its coldest, all the ice that was covering the ocean is instantly melting in contact with the lava. It would then cool down and solidify into rocky black landmasses called igneous rocks that are often glassy in texture. The moment the hot lava cools down, huge clouds of acidic steam and gases get released into the air, covering the sky. Scientists call those lays, which is a combination of the words lava and haze. Kind of like when you exit the shower and all the heat comes in contact with the cold outside air, creating a haze. Except this one would cover the whole North and South Poles, and it would be super toxic. It sometimes even contains tiny glass particles that are extremely hazardous. And this lays can travel around the world with strong enough wind and cover almost the entire Northern Hemisphere. It could also cover the southern part of New Zealand, Argentina, South Africa, and Australia. Flying an airplane through this gas wouldn't be the best idea. The heat alone emitted from the lava would be enough to cause major damage to the exterior and affect the airplane's hardware. It's a good thing you found your trusty oxygen container. The air is barely breathable at this point. You make your way to your car and drive away as fast as you can. But even your car's taken some damage. You drive out to the countryside, where the atmosphere hasn't been affected by the lava yet. But even all the way out here, the temperature is changing. The river you used to see on your weekly hikes is drying up. The plants around you are losing their green lush. The animals around have migrated to a different place. Rivers flowing into the ocean would simply create mounds of glassy igneous rocks upon contact permanently creating natural dams. The rest of the water inland, like in ponds and lakes, would eventually evaporate over time. With the rise in temperatures and no rainfall, it would be the end of water on the planet as we know it. The huge mass of ocean water plays a major role in creating clouds and rainfall. Without water in the atmosphere, the sun's heat would add to the lavas. The world would be a huge barren wasteland. The nights would be hot, and the days even hotter. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. Still, lava cools down eventually in contact with the cool air. So soon enough, the surface would start forming a thin layer of black crust that would gradually thicken over the years. The thicker the lava, the longer it takes to completely cool down on the inside. It would still be super hot though, but at least if you touch it, you won't be directly touching the burning lava. That's actually how many islands were formed. Like the Hawaiian Islands, for example. They're fully formed by lava erupting from below the ocean that dried over hundreds of thousands of years. It accumulated layers over layers of solidified lava from below the ocean until it rose above the surface 
forming islands and even mountains. As we speak, a new landmass in Hawaii is being formed by an active volcano. Scientists expect it to be a new fully formed island in about 10,000 years. So now, the view that used to be the blue ocean turned into steamy glowing orange slime that will in turn quickly transform into a solid black wasteland. But don't think you can easily walk over that ocean. It could take hundreds of years for it to fully cool down and turn into solid rock. Until then, walking on that dried lava crust would be similar to walking on a frozen lake. Except that in this case, one misstep would cause you to fall into boiling hot lava instead of ice cold water. Some regions would even take thousands of years to fully solidify. The Mariana Trench, the deepest region of the ocean, is about a whopping 43,000 feet deep. It would actually take at least 5,000 years for that much lava to completely cool down. There are many planets out there that are so-called lava planets. A recently discovered planet, K2-141b, has magma oceans, supersonic winds up to 3,000 miles per hour, and even rocky rains. That's right, the planet is so hot that it vaporizes rocks and rains them back down. Keep in mind that this planet is much closer to the sun than our planet is. Maybe their oceans once turned into lava overnight. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened. At least, the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies, forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now, there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super-profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. 
It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams lived long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks could live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. 
For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. A wanderer walking through a desert feels the scorching sun like never before. You can see him from afar thanks to his shining clothes. His long hoodie is covered with foil. It reflects sunlight and protects him from heat. The ground is so hot that shoe soles can melt on it. That's why the wanderer's boots are covered with heat-resistant material. A cloudless sky, barren land, and heat. But the wanderer is not in the desert. He's walking on the ocean's bottom. He doesn't know why this happened, but all the oceans on Earth dried up. It happened almost instantly, and even the greatest minds in the world don't know why. The wanderer knows only one thing. When it happened, his family was on the other side of the ocean. For several months, he's been traveling across this lifeless land, and he won't stop until he finds his family. The landscape around is spectacular. People have finally found out the secrets of the ocean depths. The seabed consists of huge mountain ranges and volcanoes. They fell asleep forever after the water had disappeared. Also, there are huge trenches leading to the unexplored depths of the planet. People had to build bridges to get over these enormous cracks in the ground. But most of the ocean floor is flat plains. Boundless, lifeless, merciless. The wanderers walking across a huge canyon. Once, it was swarming with sea life. The man puts on a gas mask, but not because of a sandstorm. Many fish and other marine inhabitants used to live in such canyons. Now, all that's left is a terrible smell. The wanderer passes by huge skeletons of whales. Among them, he notices dirty tents. People are hiding there from heat. The temperature in the area is much higher than in the Sahara Desert. One of the main functions of the ocean was to distribute heat all over the planet. The sun emits heat and radiation. The ocean absorbed this energy. Lots of currents were warm, and they carried this warmth around the world. The water got heated at the equator, then it evaporated and turned into clouds. When warm air rose, it pulled along colder air from below. This allowed the energy to be evenly distributed. In simple words, the ocean cooled hot places and brought warmth to cold ones. Now there's none of this. Every day the sun burns the equator and dries up the rest of the planet. The wanderer doesn't come close to the tents. He is carrying the most valuable treasure in the world and doesn't want people to notice him. The inhabitants of Earth are just trying to survive, and many have forgotten about such a thing as morality. Fortunately, the wanderer still remembers. The thoughts of the family help him remain a good person. Sometimes, it complicates his life. Like now, for example. In the distance, he sees a young girl. She doesn't look well. There's no one around, and the wanderer decides to help her. Out of his backpack, he pulls a thing worth more than all the gold on the planet. A bottle of water. The girl takes a few sips, but instead of thanking the wanderer, she starts screaming. It's a trap! Her accomplices appear from different sides. Looters. They're gonna take everything. The wanderer runs away. He hasn't eaten for several days, and his strength is leaving him. He won't be able to keep going much longer. The marauders are closing in on him. The wanderer throws the bottle aside. His pursuers rush to the water like crazy. They forget about the man and fight one another for the bottle. The chances of the wanderer's survival have greatly decreased. He could make this bottle last at least several days. Plus, he's also lost a lot of fluid because of running. In the beginning, there was no panic because of a lack of water. 
The ocean dried up, but its waters were salty anyway. People still had seas, lakes, and rivers. But the problem was that the ocean was feeding them. When the ocean water evaporated, it formed clouds. These clouds moved all over the world and enriched lakes and rivers with rain. Now, there are almost no clouds. The sun started heating Earth much more. Lakes and seas dried up alarmingly quickly. At that moment, real chaos began. The sun is going down on the horizon. Sunset is near. It's not so hot anymore. The exhausted wanderer continues walking. In the distance, he notices something that makes him stop, take out a small shovel, and start digging quickly. There's no shelter around, just a flat plain. The wanderer speeds up, otherwise it might be too late. The pit is finally ready. The man jumps down and covers his head with a cloak. A few seconds later, a strong ash storm passes through the entire plain. The smallest particles of ash can penetrate through clothes and get into the lungs. The wind is so strong that it can knock anyone down. When the oceans dried up, the sun began to burn the surface of the planet. This led to massive forest fires. The flames destroyed almost all the trees. Huge clouds of carbon dioxide and ash formed. Driven by the wind, they travel the world and poison everything around. The wanderer is sitting in the pit while a terrible hurricane is sweeping over his head. He thinks of his family and slowly falls asleep. Cold wakes him up. Frosty air chills him to the bone. So it's night now. The wanderer climbs out of the pit and finds himself under bright stars. As soon as the water dried up, almost all clouds disappeared. Factories stopped working. Cars no longer emitted carbon dioxide. Thanks to this, comets and the most distant stars can be seen in the sky. The wanderer has seen them a thousand times, but he's still not used to the breathtaking picture. It's like he's looking at the sky through a telescope. An icy gust of wind brings the wanderer back to reality. He won't survive the night if he doesn't find a warmer place. Before, nights were warmer thanks to the energy of the ocean. Now, as soon as the sun goes down, temperatures drop dramatically. The wanderer needs to move to stay warm. He starts walking faster. Soon, he notices some lights in the distance. It's probably other looters. The wanderer goes deeper into the valley. Stars in the moon illuminate his way. Unfortunately, he is running out of energy. He pulls a protein bar out of his pocket, but he needs at least a bit of water to eat it. To digest food, your body needs liquid. If the wanderer eats the bar, he'll only get thirstier. He can't walk and falls to the ground. He checks his pockets and finds a small kerosene tablet. He lights it using a matchstick. A tiny flame protects him from cold. To distract himself from thirst, the wanderer takes out an old MP3 player. He charged it during the day using the solar panels on his backpack. The man puts on headphones. Classical music calms him down. He lies on the ground next to the burning tablet. He needs to gain strength to continue his journey tomorrow. It's morning. In an hour, the sun will start burning the ground again. It's crucial to find water while he still has some time left. The wanderer inspects the territory and notices a spot where the ground is darker. In his previous life, the wanderer worked as a surveyor. He takes a few steps and touches the ground. It feels cool. There's an underground spring here. He begins to dig. The ground is getting wet. Water starts seeping out of the soil. The wanderer fills his empty bottles. Things don't look that bad anymore. It's getting a bit more difficult to breathe with each new day. In the past, phytoplankton and algae produced up to 70% of all the oxygen on the planet, but not anymore. Several days have passed. The wanderer runs out of water and food again. Fortunately, not for long. He's now walking among huge sunken ships. He sees modern aircraft carriers, liners, and even ancient pirate boats. In the distance, he spots huge mountains. The tops of these rocks are what used to be called the shore. The ocean floor is ending. The thoughts about reuniting with his family give him more strength. The man reaches the top and finds himself in the middle of a ruined city. It's empty. Where have all the people gone? Where is my family now? The wanderer asks himself. The man walks through the abandoned streets and meets an old man. He says that almost all the people who used to live here left the city and went to Antarctica. 
the Wanderer has a new goal. He's going to get to the icy mainland no matter what. He will find his family. The ocean is one of the most incredible places on Earth. It's not only beautiful, but also dangerous. We all know about sharks, huge octopuses, heavy storms, and the Bermuda Triangle. But there's something more terrifying and more dangerous than all of these things. I'm talking about rogue waves. The four-passenger yacht Minionette is sailing through the Cape of Good Hope in southern Africa. A storm blows through, but the yacht successfully survives it. By evening, the wind has completely subsided. The sea is calm. The team, tired after the storm, is going to rest. At this moment, seemingly out of nowhere, a 39-foot wave appears and crashes over the yacht with terrifying force. The yacht succumbs and sinks. Thankfully, the passengers escape in a lifeboat. For the next 24 days, they drift on the open sea until they're picked up by a passing ship. No one believed the stories of the surviving passengers about a huge wave. This story isn't a plot from a thriller movie, but a real event that occurred on July 5th, 1884. Now imagine that you're sailing on a modern yacht in the open sea. The sun is shining brightly, there's not a single cloud. The sea is crystal clear and calm. What could be better than a vacation like this? Suddenly, you hear a very loud hum. In 2-3 to three seconds, a huge 33-foot wave appears from the calm surface of the sea and crashes into your yacht. Fortunately, the ship manages to stay afloat, and the wave disappears as suddenly as it appeared. This is also a real case that happened to the owner of the Calarin yacht on June 17, 2018. These waves have different names. White, Rogue, Wandering, Monster. The French call them a bad joke. Unfortunately, there's nothing to laugh at. A meeting with such a wave usually ends with a sunken ship. Sirens, sea monsters, the anger of Poseidon. This is how people explain the appearance of massive waves in ancient times. Christopher Columbus was the first to write a note about a rogue wave as a natural phenomenon. In August 1498, his team explored the shores of West India, later America, when suddenly, all of the crew members heard a deafening roar, and then a towering 88-foot wave appeared out of nowhere. Fortunately, the wave passed by, and Columbus went on his way. After that, a lot of reports were recorded about this phenomenon, but no one believed the sailors. Mermaids, kraken, and now monster waves? Come on, guys! This is the typical reaction to anyone claiming to have witnessed the nightmarish waves. Even when a 74-foot rogue wave suddenly fell on the British liner Queen Mary in 1942, the 15,000 people who lived to tell the tale were rarely taken seriously. Only in 1995 was the rogue wave officially recorded with special instruments. That day, an 85-foot wave hit the Norwegian gas platform Doppner. In order to study the nature of these waves, in 2000, the European Union created an international project called Max Wave. As part of this project, scientists launched two satellites to monitor the world's oceans. However, they ended up with more questions than answers. There's a special wave theory, according to which, the larger the wave, the less likely it is to occur. Max Wave satellites managed to record waves up to 82 feet. But here's the most interesting part. Such a wave should only appear every 200 years. But satellites discovered 10 monster waves in the first three weeks of operation. 19 years have passed since then, and we still know very little about it. The worst thing is that scientists have no ideas about how to predict the appearance of these waves in advance. Modern radars and sonars have recorded the proportions of these waves. Their height reaches from 39 to 164 feet, their speed can reach 62 miles per hour, and their life expectancy is from 20 seconds to 2 minutes. Although information is scarce, 
scientists have managed to divide these waves into three types. The first type is the classic white wave. It appears not only in a storm, but also in a calm sea. After an unexpected appearance, it also suddenly dissolves into the water and leaves no residue. The second type is three sisters, and you guessed it, these are three consecutive waves, one of which is more massive than the others. Even a huge supertanker could break under the weight if caught in such waves. The third type is wave monster. Of all three types, this wave is the most dangerous and unpredictable. Imagine a 15-story building. The spectacle is certainly amazing, but I wouldn't want to see it in real life. Anyway, you can watch a lot of videos with rogue waves on YouTube. But after you watch our video… But what provokes these lonely waves? No one knows for sure. Perhaps rogue waves are of the same nature as tsunamis? Well, not at all. Tsunamis occur as a result of underwater earthquakes and grow as they draw closer to the coast. Some believe that they appear when the surface sea current encounters a strong headwind. Others are sure that the waves are born from the collision of warm and cold currents. Still others are convinced that it happens because of gravitational anomalies, when gravity sharply decreases or increases. There's also the theory of wave interference, small waves combining to form one big one, just like a snowball. But the most interesting theory is that waves form due to kinetic vampirism. Insert Dracula joke here. According to this version, under certain natural conditions, waves acquire the ability to exchange kinetic energy. And among all the waves, there will be one vampire wave, which will absorb the energy of the others. After accumulating enough energy, the vampire wave splashes it out. This theory explains the impact force and its sudden disappearance. Some oceanographers believe that rogue waves are to blame for the disappearance of ships in the most mysterious place in the Atlantic Ocean, the Bermuda Triangle. And while it's likely that rogue waves periodically appear there, it's impossible to consider them the main solution to the mysteries of the triangle. Besides ships, planes disappear there, and it's unlikely that the waves can reach them. Adding even more mystery to the phenomenon, these waves appear not only in the seas and oceans, but also in lakes. They were recorded numerous times in the Great Lakes. In Lake Superior, the largest of all the Great Lakes, the appearance of the Three Sisters has been recorded several times. In addition to rogue waves, sailors have told about a more terrible phenomenon, sea hollows. Imagine that this is a very big wave, but just the opposite. It goes under the water, forming a large dip in the sea. But unlike waves, such hollows have never been officially recorded. Rogue waves can be dangerous in a similar way by forming sea holes in the water. When the wave builds up, it draws in all the water around it. So near the base, these holes can be very deep. If the bow or stern of a ship ends up in one, the ship can instantly sink. I think the Jaws movie should be replaced by a new film, Waves. Who cares about sharks now, when at any moment a wave the size of a skyscraper could come rushing towards you? Hey, anybody remember the movie The Poseidon Adventure? That was a rogue wave that capsized the ocean liner. There are no ways to anticipate rogue waves, but you can significantly reduce the risk of meeting one. Study the history and meteorological records of the area you want to visit. Most often, rogue waves are found off the east coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean and in the North Atlantic. By the way, it was there in 1985 at the Fastnet Rock Lighthouse that the highest wave ever recorded was captured. Its height reached 157 feet. If rogue waves don't scare you and you're determined to set sail, then watch for weather changes and, most importantly, look often at the horizon. Single waves can appear in the distance, so you have a chance to evade them. And if one narrowly misses sinking your boat, well, as it goes by, be sure to wave. 
What do you think lies at the bottom of the ocean? What if I told you that, together with the remains of the Titanic and other mysterious underwater animals, ocean floors have buried over 20 million tons of gold within them? Crazy, right? As it seems, that gold is of difficult extraction, and nobody has attempted to dig it out. But if it were to be extracted, each human alive on the planet could be gifted 9 pounds of gold. Now, would you imagine that? In 2016, during an auction at a large fish market in Tokyo, Japan, an endangered species of bluefin tuna was sold for 14 million yen which is the equivalent of more or less 117,000 US dollars. And that wasn't even the most expensive fish ever sold. As it appears, bidding on fish has become sort of a tradition at the Skigi. Am I pronouncing this correctly? Anyways, at this famous fish market in Japan. The first auction of the new year attracts bidders from all over the world to place their bets in the hopes of buying rare species of fish. Apparently, the bluefin tuna ranks as one of the most expensive fish out there today. It weighs around 989 pounds. Back in 2019, a single one was sold for a mind-boggling price of $3.1 million, the highest amount anyone has paid for a fish so far. If we do the math, that means one pound of bluefin tuna costs around 3600 bucks. Who knew fish could be that expensive? A recent study conducted in 2011 showed that a single reef shark in Palau, an island nation in the Pacific Ocean, would have an estimated life value of nearly $2 million. This value is based on the number of tourists that reef sharks attract to dive sites. That's pretty neat. There is no doubt that the ocean is full of riches. It may seem crazy to think about nature this way, but if someone wanted to buy all the ocean water and everything inside it, Do you have any idea how much it would cost? Is that price even measurable? Well, according to research published by the World Wildlife Fund in association with the Global Change Institute from the University of Queensland, the net worth of the ocean is indeed quantifiable, and there are reasons why that is so. But before we reveal the price tag, let's try to understand the scope of what we're talking about. Now, oceans occupy over 70% of the Earth's surface. They carry around more or less 320 cubic miles of salt water. For scale, it would take around 800 trillion Olympic-sized pools to fill all the water in the ocean. 800 trillion! Now, that's a lot of swimming pools, I'll give you that. The ocean occupies over 99% of the Earth's total living space. That's almost our entire planet. If that doesn't sound right, do you have any idea how deep oceans are? We could probably fit all the cities of the world down there, and there would still be ample space left. Some say that if you took Mount Everest, turned it upside down, and tossed it on one of the ocean's deepest ends, it still wouldn't reach the seabed. There would be a little over a mile left to reach the ocean floor. The truth is, we know very little about our oceans. Much more money and effort has been dedicated to space travel. For instance, isn't it funny to think that even though we are 239,000 miles away from the Moon, and even further away from Venus and Mars, the surface of these planets has been almost 100% photographed and studied by modern scientists? How much of our seabed would you guess we've mapped so far? Well, what if I told you that we've charted only 5% of all seafloors? Crazy, right? It gets even crazier if we think that over 94% of all living beings are actually aquatic creatures. And so many of these, we have no idea about. Some say that the ocean is the final frontier of humankind. And it is true that very few people have ventured down into the deep waters. We've sent over 12 men to walk the moon. But no more than 4 men have attempted to dive all the way down to the deep, deep sea. For example, Does the name James Cameron ring a bell? Who here still hasn't watched Titanic? Well, Cameron was the director of the blockbuster movie Titanic, and some years after he shot it, he took part in one of the two manned expeditions ever to go down to Challenger Deep. Now, Challenger Deep, as the name suggests, is one of the furthest points at the bottom of the ocean. It's located deep within the Mariana Trench. Cameron decided he wanted to be the first man to arrive at the deepest point of the ocean, and so he did. Now, prior to him, 
Challenger Deep had only been reached by Jacques Picard and Don Walsh back in the 1960s. But Cameron managed to travel even farther down than the previous expedition. He was the first one to have touched the astounding depth of 35,787 feet below the surface. Even more shocking is to know that the submersible he rode on to arrive at such depth cost him around $10 million. The expedition itself cost half that, adding up to a total of $15 million to satisfy his wish. But none of this compares to the final price for shooting the movie Titanic, which arrived at an estimate of $200 million back in 1998. Did you know that the ocean actually grows in size? I mean, it's already huge, and it has no plans of getting smaller. According to research, the Atlantic Ocean grows 2 inches bigger every year. Now, how could we ever put a price tag on something so unique and essential to life as the ocean? According to the World Wildlife Fund, measuring the price of the ocean is a way of bringing awareness and attention to one of the world's most precious jewels. This type of measuring happens through what is called ecosystem valuation. There are normally two ways of deciding how much something costs. One is through market valuation, and the other is non-market valuation. Imagine that. Which means that someone goes around asking other people how much they would hypothetically pay for something, in this case, the ocean. And then later, economists do some type of crazy calculation and arrive at an estimated price. They try to factor in all of what we've mentioned before. The astronomical price of bluefin tuna, for example. The life value of a shark. Maybe they even asked James Cameron how much he would pay for all of the ocean. Well, jokes aside, the non-market price they arrived at for the ocean was $24 trillion. According to this estimated price, the ocean is worth more or less the same amount as the GDP of a few powerhouse countries of the world. If compared to the world's top 10 economies, the ocean would rank number one with an annual value of $24 trillion. If we were to dig a little deeper, this would mean that one cubic mile of water from the ocean costs $13. Well, that's a little more affordable, isn't it? Even if it is highly valued economically, oceans are essential not only to human life, but to the majority of the world's animal and fish population. Life on Earth would be impossible without ocean water, which is why it is so important to make it highly accessible. It's not like we need a spaceship to visit the nearest ocean. Depending on where you live on the globe, a few hours drive or a short stroll and you're there. If you were asked how much you would hypothetically pay for all of the world's seabed, how much would you consider paying for it? A few trillions as well? Okay, let's try something together. Open any world map you have available. It can be the one you find in your bookcase or even an online version. Take a look at the vast area covered by water. That's 71% of the Earth's surface. And all that is salt water from the world's oceans. There aren't any borders between the four oceans we've all come to know. But oceanographers and the world's countries did traditionally split these waters into four distinct regions. The Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, and Arctic Oceans. And here comes the big surprise. The scientific community has recently recognized the fifth body of water. It's called the Southern Ocean, and three of the four original oceans border it. It circumnavigates Antarctica and the lower portion of the globe and reaches Australia and the southern portions of Africa and South America. What makes this ocean so special? How did the scientific community eventually recognize it? And more importantly, what mysterious creatures does it hide? (laughs) Let's find out! The Antarctic Ocean, or the Southern Ocean, was first mentioned back in 1937 in the second edition of the International Hydrographic Organization's Limits of Oceans and Seas. That's a mouthful. Back then, this organization considered that it was wrong to consider the Antarctic Ocean as its own distinct body of water. Why? Well, because at that time, an ocean was defined as water surrounded by land and not water surrounding land. However, they reconsidered it in 2000 and voted to include this ocean in the official list. They also decided on the name Southern Ocean over the commonly used Antarctic Ocean. 
Finally, the organization concluded that the ocean should be considered as ending at the 60th parallel south latitude. But how old is this ocean? Well, many specialists believe it to have formed only 30 million years ago, which would make it the youngest of the world's oceans. It was created when Antarctica and South America moved away from each other during the early stages of our planet's development. This unique water current is a distinctive component of the Southern Ocean, as it helps keep the waters flowing around the icy continent. It's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and it moves to the east with incredible speed. It's estimated that it moves an enormous amount of water per second. Some of the disputes regarding the Southern Ocean also have to do with this amazing current. Some specialists believe it separates the water of the Southern Ocean from the waters of the nearing Atlantic or Pacific. Only the rapid circulating water is considered the Southern Ocean. On the other hand, though, a handful of scientists say that the current actually makes the naming issue more complex by not limiting the waters to a specific geographic location. They believe that the waters in the current are different in terms of composition from waters in the northern oceans because they are way colder and have a lot more salt. Sailors don't really like this new body of water, mostly because of the frequent cyclone-like storms that it experiences. They happen because of the big temperature difference between the ice packs and the ocean waves. As a result, these storms are very difficult to surpass for any sailors that happen to encounter them. I mean, really, these are the strongest winds found anywhere on our planet. More so, the vessels going through this area must also be wary of the frequent icebergs that may pop up every now and then, and also of the low surface temperatures. Just to paint you a better picture, some of the icebergs found here can span over several hundred meters and can exist all year round, regardless of the season. The latitudes from 50 to 70 have even earned the nicknames of Furious 50s or the Shrieking 60s because of these intense year-round storms. Even the landscape is unique. They say the Southern Ocean has bluer glaciers, colder air, and more intimidating mountains than anywhere else in the world. Now, let's get to the mysterious creatures that call this place home, as thousands of species of wildlife live only here and nowhere else in the world. Let's start with the quirky sea pig, or one of the sea cucumbers as it's sometimes called. There are a lot of them in the waters off Antarctica. Why is it called that way, though? Because of its pink hue and round, bloated looks. On a closer look, it even appears to have a little tail and set of ears, just like a pig. They do help a lot with the quality of the waters here, filtering sand and sediment. Then there are the hoff crabs that live on the floor of the Antarctic Sea. The Southern Ocean is a cold water environment, but crabs are more adapted to warmer waters. So hoff crabs gather around the warmth made by volcanic vents. They get the needed warmth and food here. You can find them in large piles, one on top of another, literally filling the space of the vent openings. Now, wonder how they got their unofficial name? Well, it's because of their apparent similarity to the actor David Hasselhoff, whose impressive chest reminded explorers of the crab. Okay. Ever seen a fish that's completely transparent? You'd have to get to these waters down in the south, but they do exist, and they are simply called the ice fish. You can basically see inside them, being completely clear and all. That's because of their see-through skin and because they don't have any red blood cells. Their special power is that they can use antifreeze to prevent their bodies from going solid in the cold waters of the Southern Ocean. Instead of the standard thicker blood, the red one with hemoglobin, ice fish have thinner blood that moves around more easily throughout their bodies, hence giving them the much-needed nutrients and oxygen. Now, is there a monster hidden in these waters? Some people believe this to be the case. And thanks to recent research, we even have video footage of it. Some Australian researchers stumbled upon a bunch of weird-looking creatures that were swimming near the seafloor of the Southern Ocean. This pink blob-like fish seemed to be propelled by a little pair of fins. To quote them on it, it seemed to resemble a chicken just before you put it in the oven. I'm not sure I even want to know what that looks like. It took them some time and research to identify the monster. It's a shy species of sea cucumber, known more by its uh, creative nickname, the Headless Chicken Monster. 
we've known this creature has existed since the late 1800s, but we've barely ever seen it. And we've only ever captured it on tape once before when it was spotted in the Gulf of Mexico, which is quite far from the waters off the coast of East Antarctica. There's so much we don't know about this creature, like how many of them exist in our waters and how they live, eat, and reproduce. Ever heard of the emperor penguin? It's not a penguin species that just happens to have a crown on its head, if that's what you're thinking. But they are one of those penguins that inhabit this specific location and are also the largest species of their kind altogether. What makes them special is that they make their colonies on the sea ice, and most of them never step foot on land. More so, penguin dads lose almost half their weight while incubating the eggs. They're also fascinating swimmers, able to dive deeper and longer than any other bird, up to 700 feet. Not to mention they can stay submerged for up to 18 minutes at a time as they gather food. We have yet to uncover all the secrets of the mysterious Southern Ocean, but it's clear that it's home to some unique and fragile marine ecosystems. Recognizing it as a new ocean could be one way to focus the public attention on it and help its conservation. My, my, it's wet out here. In 2016, scientists decided to study the widest part of the Atlantic Ocean between Africa and South America. It's kind of lonely there. They went days without seeing a single plane or ship. It was mostly just dolphins and whales swimming by. They were in the middle of nowhere. So why? They were floating right above one of the most important geological spots on Earth, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's where two monster tectonic plates meet. Tectonic plates are massive jigsaw pieces that are constantly moving, even though we usually can't feel them. They form the Earth's crust and, in this case, meet beneath the Atlantic Ocean. The researchers floated over the ridge and dropped down some instruments that detect waves, earthquakes, and other vibrations. A year later, they came back to collect the results. At first, the goal was to learn more about the history of the two plates. But the instruments picked up a whole lot more than that. They found out some stuff about the future, too. Way down at the bottom, there's a layer of extremely hot liquid rock that's constantly rising up, pushing on the tectonic plates and causing them to move apart from each other. That means that the Atlantic Ocean is expanding about 2 inches every year, pushing Europe and Africa away from the Americas. At the same time, its bigger neighbor, the Pacific Ocean, is shrinking. It's the biggest ocean, right now, with a huge area that's around 30% of the Earth's surface. Its average depth is 13,000 feet and is home to the famous Mariana Trench, the deepest spot in any ocean. And yeah, it's now shrinking by around one-fifth of a square mile per year. Some scientists even believe that, eventually, millions and millions of years from now, the Pacific Ocean could completely disappear. This ocean is where we think most earthquakes happen. Plus, it's where a lot of the world's volcanoes are. All that causes lots of shaking. Plates move around and old parts of the Earth's crust get destroyed. The ocean floor can't grow fast enough to replace it. This means some big changes are coming in the future. A couple of inches isn't exactly a big deal. But after a few hundred million years, there'll probably be a new supercontinent on Earth. Australia is slowly heading north, and it could eventually collide with Korea, Japan, and eastern China. Africa is moving too. In 50 million years, it'll be pushing right up against the southern parts of Europe. Since it's all happening so slowly, I've had a chance to think up some future scenarios. Okay, not me. A bunch of super brainy scientists with even brainier computers. The first scenario, a monster landmass called Novo. The Americas would slam into Antarctica, then they'd team up and head over to Africa. Meanwhile, Africa would have already smashed into Europe and Asia. Not bad, at least you'd save some money on plane tickets. But for most people, it would take an epic road trip to get to a beach somewhere. The second scenario is Ultima. I feel like these all sound like car names. Anyway, in this scenario, the Atlantic stops getting wider. Actually, it's the opposite. It starts closing in on itself. This new, super cool continent would be surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. Scenario 3 Orica. 
Both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans eventually shrink down until they either disappear or end up like tiny little lakes. All the life in these two oceans is gone. Instead, some new ocean starts forming to replace them. And the new supercontinent? It has Australia in the corner, with the Americans and East Asia each on the opposite side of a small puddle that used to be the Pacific. The rest of the planet is one big unexplored super-ocean inhabited by… who knows? I won't be around then. Number 4. Amasia. There's that car thing again. This one predicts Africa, Australia, and all the continents except Antarctica start moving north. Sorry, Antarctica, even planet Earth keeps forgetting about you. Better luck next time! Well, way off in the future, it might be possible to take a big old road trip across every continent, or drive across the African-South American border, or even get to Australia without having to take the longest flight of your life. But we've got a while to wait. Hmm, what should I do for the next 250 million years? Binge watch some Bright Side? Tectonic plates move at different speeds, some slower, some slightly faster. Your hair and fingernails actually grow at roughly the same speed as these beasts move. Imagine if everyone lived on one of those supercontinents. Animals would finally be able to cross continents and meet species they've never seen before. Leopards, rhinos, lions, elephants… Imagine if they got curious enough to set out on a journey out of their habitat. A lion might meet a polar bear. Kangaroos could finally leave the land down under, and birds that migrate to warmer places would have to totally reorganize their travel schedules. Who knows what the climate would be like? Playing around with the continental jigsaw puzzle isn't exactly a new thing. Our world didn't always look like this. 300 million years ago, our planet didn't have seven continents. It had only one, a supercontinent called Pangaea. Pangaea was surrounded by only one ocean. Over time, it slowly started falling apart. At one point, South America, Antarctica, Australia, and Africa were one unit, and North America and Eurasia were another. Over time, these continents also splintered off, each heading in its own direction. Scientists have discovered many similar plants and animal fossils on continents that are separated by huge oceans. Even when you just glance at a map, you can see how Africa and South America look like two massive puzzle pieces that fit together perfectly. When you look at all the oceans and seas on a map, it may look like they just flow right into each other, like there's only one big ocean and people gave different names to different parts. You wouldn't think that if you've ever been to the place where they meet. The Atlantic and Pacific have a strict border that looks like an invisible wall separating two completely different worlds. You can clearly see different colors and waters, and they don't mix. Of course, there's no wall or any actual physical border, but not all water's the same. The Pacific and Atlantic have different densities, amounts of salt, temperatures, and a whole bunch of differences. The borders that separate two bodies of water are called ocean clines. The line you see dividing the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean is mostly caused by different salt levels. This is what layers of water with different salt levels look like. It's like they're separated with cling film, each one with a different color because it has different things growing in it. To see a clear, noticeable border, one sea or ocean has to be a whole lot saltier than the other. Want to get active and use up all the salt in your house? Pour some colored salty water or seawater into a glass bowl, then add fresh water on top. Voila! The Pacific Ocean is the less salty one. That's because there are loads more rivers flowing into it. Heavier liquids are heavy, so they should sink to the bottom. But then, why is the border between the Atlantic and Pacific a vertical line and not a horizontal one? First, the difference in density of these two salty beasts may be enough to stop them from mixing, but it's not really enough to send one of them to the bottom with the other floating above it. There's another reason, and it's all about the Earth spinning around. Say you're flying from Chile to New England. If you fly straight north, by the time you get there, the Earth will have turned a bit, and you'd be nowhere near your destination. To get to the right place, the pilot needs to fly in a bit of a curve. That's sort of the same reason that currents move around in different directions. 
the currents in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans move away from each other, so they don't really mix at their border, even though they're both just water. Confused? Yeah, me too. When you look at the seas and oceans on a map, you might think that they just flow into each other. Like, there's really only one big ocean, and people just arbitrarily gave different names to its different parts. Well, guess what? You'll be amazed at how much more substantial the borders between them actually are. For example, the border between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans is like a literal line between two different worlds. It looks like the two oceans meet at an invisible wall, which does not let them flow into each other and mix their waters. Why on earth does that happen? Obviously, there's no actual invisible wall inside, and water is just water. So what could be interfering with its next one? Well, the thing is that water isn't just water. There can be different kinds. The Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans have different densities and chemical makeups, the level of salinity and other qualities. One can see by their color that they are far from the same. Borders like this, between two bodies of water with different physical and biological characteristics, are known as haloclines. Jacques-Yves Cousteau discovered one of them while he was deep diving in the Strait of Gibraltar. The layers of water with different solidity looked like they were divided with a transparent film, and each layer had its own distinct flora and fauna. Haloclines appear when water in one ocean or sea is at least five times saltier than in the other. You can create a halocline at home if you pour some seawater or colored salty water in a glass and then add some fresh water on top of it. The only difference is that your halocline will be horizontal and ocean haloclines are vertical. For those of you who are paying attention in chemistry class, you might remember that if you have two liquids with different densities in one space, the denser liquid should eventually end up below the less dense one. By that logic, the border between the two oceans should look not like a vertical line, but a horizontal one. And the difference between their solidity would become less obvious the closer they got to each other. So why doesn't it work like that? Firstly, the difference in density of the two oceans is not big enough for one of them to sink down and the other one to rise up, but it is big enough to not let them mix. Another reason is inertia. There is an inertial force known as the Coriolis force, which influences objects when they are moving in a system of axes, which in turn are moving as well. In simpler terms, the Earth is moving, and all the moving objects on it are carried along, acted upon by this Coriolis force, deviating slightly from their natural course. As a result, the objects on the Earth's surface don't move straight on, but deviate in a curve clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern. But because the Earth is moving slowly, after all, it does take the planet a whole day to make a full circle around its axis, the Coriolis effect isn't easy to observe in the short term. It becomes easier to notice only in long-term intervals, like with cyclones or ocean flows. And this is why the direction of flows in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans is different. This difference also doesn't let them mix. Another important difference between these two ocean waters is the strength of molecule connection, or surface tensile strength. Thanks to this strength, molecules of the same kind hold on to each other. The two oceans have totally different surface tensile strengths, which also doesn't let them mix. Maybe if the waters were completely still, they could gradually start mixing over time, but as they flow in opposite directions, they just don't have time to do this. We think that it's just water in both oceans, but its separate molecules meet for just a very short moment and then get carried away with the ocean flow. But if you think that it's only the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans that don't get along with each other, you are sorely mistaken. There's lots of places on the planet where the waters of the two seas or rivers don't mix, and for even more weird reasons. For example, there's a different kind of border called a thermocline. These are borders between waters of different temperatures like between the warm water of the Gulf Stream and the much colder North Atlantic Ocean. But the most interesting kinds are called chemoclines. These are borders between waters having different microclimate and chemical makeup. The Sargasso Sea is the biggest and most widely known chemocline. It is a sea within the Atlantic Ocean, which has no shores, but is very obviously distinct. You can't not notice it. Let's now take a look at some other spectacular clines we have 
on planet Earth. And just as a heads up, I might mispronounce some of these names coming up, so please forgive me. First up, we have the North and Baltic Seas. These two seas meet near the Danish city of Skagen. The water in them doesn't mix because of different densities. Sometimes you can see the waves of the two seas clash into each other, making foam. Their waters do mix very, very gradually. That's why the Baltic Sea is slightly saline. If there had been no water coming to it from the North Sea, it would have just been a freshwater lake. Next up, the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. They meet at the Strait of Gibraltar and have both a different density and salinity. So there's two reasons their waters don't mix. Then we have the Caribbean Sea and Atlantic Ocean. The place where they meet is near the Antilles, and it's very easy to spot. It looks like someone has painted water with two different shades of blue. Another place where these two meet is Eleuthera Island of the Bahamas. The Caribbean Sea water is turquoise, and the Atlantic Ocean water is dark blue. There is also the Suriname River and the Atlantic Ocean, which meet near Paramaribo in South America. How about the Uruguay River and its afflux? These two meet in Misiones province in Argentina. One of them is claimed to be used in agriculture, and the other has an almost red tint to it because of loam during rainy seasons. Here's an interesting one. The Rio Negro and the Solimoes rivers, part of the Amazon River. Six miles from Manau in Brazil, the Rio Negro and Solimoe rivers flow into each other, but don't mix for about 2.5 miles. The Rio Negro is dark and the Solimoes is light. They have different temperatures and speeds of flow. Then there's the Moselle and Rhine rivers, which meet in Koblenz, Germany. The water in the Rhine is lighter than that of the Moselle. Okay, how about three different bodies, like the Ilz, Danube, and Inn rivers? The junction of these three rivers is in Passau, Germany. The Ilz is a small mountain river to the left, the Danube is in the middle, and the Inn is a light river to the right. The Inn is wider than the Danube here, but is still its afflux. Take a look at the Alaknanda and Bhagirati rivers, which meet in India. Alaknanda is dark and Bhagirati is light. I really hope I got those right. The Irtish and Ulba rivers flow into each other in Kazakhstan, near the city whose name is Ust Kamenogorsk. The Irtish has clean water and the Ulba's water is cloudy. Moving further east, the Jianling and Yangtze rivers meet in Chongqing, China. I really hope that's close at least. The Jialing is clean and the Yangtze is brown. The Irtish River actually has another intersection with the Om River. These two rivers flow into each other in Omsk, Russia. Here, the Irtish is cloudy and the Om is pure and transparent. Speaking of Russia, the Chuya and Katun rivers meet in the Altai Republic. The water of the Chuya has an unusual cloudy white color here and looks dense and thick. The Khatun, by contrast, is clean and turquoise. Flowing into each other, they form a single two-colored stream that does not mix for some time. On the other side of the globe, we have the Green and Colorado Rivers. The place of their junction is National Park Canyonlands in Utah, USA. The Colorado River is brown and the green is, well, green. The corridors of these rivers go through rocks with different chemical makeup. That's why they have such a big contrast of colors. Last, but not least, we have the Rhone and Arve rivers. They flow into each other in Geneva, Switzerland. The Rhone is a pure river that flows out from the lakes of Geneva, while the Arve is cloudy and gets its water from the glaciers of the Chamonix Valley. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all the strange clients on our beautiful planet, but as you can see, it happens a lot more often than you think. These are the kinds of environmental oddities that can really teach you about the way the natural world works. If you're curious enough, of course. Thanks for watching. Oh, and let me know how well I did with the pronunciations. Constructive feedback is always helpful. Breaking news! Mercury is getting smaller. Well, we used to think that our planet was the only one in the solar system that had tectonic activities, meaning that the planet releases heat because plates under the crust move which changes the surface and eventually makes the planet smaller. But it happens on Mercury, too. Researchers took pictures of the planet back in 2016. These pictures showed landforms that were reminiscent of cliffs. 
They're called fault scarps. Since they are relatively small, the team believes they were formed not very long ago, which means Mercury is still contracting, even 4.5 billion years after the solar system formed. Mercury has a solid inner core, and there's a liquid metal outer core that surrounds it. It's still going through a cooling process. In fact, all rocky planets are still cooling from the times when they were initially formed. As those liquid parts of the planet's core become more solid, the planet contracts and becomes smaller. How come you don't see planets twinkling like stars? If you were up in space, you wouldn't see stars twinkling. But on Earth, you see it because of the atmosphere. Our protective blanket of air refracts the light of stars, which means it scatters it in a zigzag pattern. We perceive this as the twinkle. Planets appear way bigger than just pinpoints. Their light also zigs and zags after hitting the Earth's atmosphere, but these motions kinda cancel each other out, which is why we see their steady light. Now, if you brought a block of lead on Venus, it would melt like a block of ice on our home planet. The surface temperature on Venus goes up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Even when researchers send spacecraft up there, it can't withstand the environment for too long. One craft, for instance, landed there in 1982 and managed to stay for only two hours. But a team still got the first color pictures of Venus and analyzed some of the planet's soil. Planets collide with asteroids, comets, other planets, and the rest of the celestial bodies that move through space. But galaxies also collide. Milky Way, our galaxy, is about 2.5 million light-years away from Andromeda, our closest galaxy neighbor. They are getting closer and speeding toward each other at 250,000 miles per hour. It's inevitable. One day they'll collide and everything will change. Two galaxies will merge into one brand new, unique one. And some planets and stars won't survive. But according to predictions, this won't happen for another 4 billion years. Plenty of time to, well, do most anything. The combination of the gravity on our planet and the gravitational force of the moon leads to changes in ocean tides. So when you jump, you're pulled back to the land because of the invisible force that pulls things toward each other called fill in the blank. Gravity, good for you. The moon has about 80 times smaller mass than the Earth, but it still has a gravitational pull. As our planet rotates, the moon's gravitational pull influences the closest part of the Earth. It affects the whole planet, not just the water. But the land is denser than the water, which is why we see the effects of the moon's gravity on the water only. And the results are the tides. On the opposite side of our planet, the one that's farthest from the moon and where the moon's gravity is the weakest, the tide is high because the moon pulls the rest of the Earth towards itself, away from us. What do you think space smells like? Well, you can't actually smell it because your nose doesn't work in a vacuum. But astronauts that work aboard the ISS have said they've noticed a specific metallic aroma on the surface of their spacesuits after repressurizing the airlock. They compared it to the odor of welding fumes. Other things in space have a specific smell too. For instance, there's a lot of hydrogen sulfide in the atmosphere of Uranus, which smells like rotten eggs. Venus and Mars have a similar odor. The atmosphere on Mercury is quite sparse, which means it doesn't have much of a smell. On Jupiter, it depends where you are in the atmosphere. Some parts have high levels of ammonia, so you'd smell something like cleaning fluid. Other parts have an egg-like smell, but the rest, the parts with high levels of hydrogen cyanide, smells like bitter almonds. And you don't want to take a big whiff of that, trust me. Here on our planet, when you try to fuse two metal bits together, you have to apply enough heat that the metal gets to its melting point. It's way simpler up in space. You don't need heat or any action at all to stick two pieces of metal together forever. It's something we know as cold welding. It happens when the metal bits slide over each other. They have protective oxide layers. On the Earth, that's something that stops them from fusing. But in space, this type of protection is gone. So the electrons from one metal piece simply flow into the other one, and they become one. There are rocks from space all over the Earth. In 1996, a geologist found a rock in the Sahara Desert. After studying its composition, scientists realized they hadn't seen anything like it before, even on other planets or with other meteorites. 
One theory says this stone was even older than our solar system. It had a specific combination of elements that was probably characteristic of early solar nebula. Pluto was demoted from a planet to a dwarf planet, partially because of another dwarf planet called Eris. Eris was found in 2005. It has a similar size as Pluto, so astronomers were worried that the number of space bodies that orbit the Sun and that are waiting to be discovered might have been compromised when it comes to being an official planet. So after they discovered Eris, they set up new standards for a celestial body to be called a planet. Round, orbit the Sun, and orbit clear of small objects are just some of the criteria for a celestial body to be considered as a planet. And you have to score well on the SAT. There are more than 20,000 pieces of space junk, junk that humans created, circling around our planet. And these are just the pieces that are larger than a softball, while the real number of total pieces our researchers track is way bigger, somewhere around 500,000. There are millions of bits so small we can't even track them. In space, junk can move at high speeds, sometimes more than 17,500 miles per hour. That means even small objects, like a chip of paint, can damage an operational spacecraft. So the International Space Station has to carefully maneuver itself to avoid space junk. And there's another potential problem there. It's called Kessler syndrome. When there's so much junk in low orbit of our planet, it smashes together, which leads to more and more debris, like some sort of space domino effect. One of the potential ways to solve this is by using nets that would push the objects into our atmosphere, and then we could clean up at least some of the space junk. Neptune has a pretty interesting moon called Triton. It kind of reminds us of Pluto because of its similar composition, but it's also in retrograde orbit. Triton is probably one of the icy objects in the Kuiper Belt. Neptune's gravity probably trapped it at some point and turned it into its own moon because Triton has been orbiting Neptune ever since, and it's been doing it in the opposite direction that Neptune is rotating. One of Triton's coolest features is its erupting geysers. There's water on two of Saturn's moons. The first one, Enceladus, has a whole ocean made up of salt water. And based on some complex organic molecules, there could even be a sign there's some form of life. But this is just a theory that no one can yet confirm. Titan, the other moon, could also have signs of life. Any place in space that has both carbon-containing chemicals and water is a potential home for some form of living organism. What's the coldest planet in our solar system? Your first thought is probably Neptune, since it's the farthest planet from the Sun. But it's actually Uranus. It's 20 times further away from the Sun than we are. The average temperature at its cloud tops, and that's what we call the surface temperature in gas giants, since they don't have a solid surface, is minus 315 degrees Fahrenheit. Enough to give you a bad case of freezer burn. Planets that are so far away from our sun can't get much heat, which is why some heat comes from their core, similar to how the core of our planet is hotter than the surface. But it's not enough. So both Neptune and Uranus are cold. But Neptune has methane in its atmosphere. On Earth, methane is a greenhouse gas, which means it traps heat like a thick jacket that keeps you warm. And Uranus has less methane in its atmosphere, which is why it's a bit colder than Neptune, even though Neptune is farther. Speaking of Uranus, did you know a season there lasts for one pretty long day? Yup, that one day is equal to 42 years. The planet makes a single circle on its axis in 17 hours. But its tilt is so pronounced that one or the other pole is mostly directed towards the Sun. This means that a day on the planet's north pole lasts 42 Earth years, which is half of a Uranian year. So if you could go to Uranus and stand on its north pole, you'd see the sunrise in the sky. You'd circle around for the entire summer, after which you'd face 42 years of darkness and winter. Uh, no thanks, I'll stay here. In the past 30 years, scientists have made an incredible discovery of a new creature living deep beneath the surface of the ocean. And the name of the creature is the harp sponge. Now, if you're wondering why it took so long to come across this animal, then I might have the answer. These creatures typically hang out at a depth of roughly 11,100 feet beneath the ocean's waves. 
The sponge species was first discovered off the coast of California thanks to a robot that was sturdy enough to explore those crazy depths the ocean has to offer. This is no doubt an area of the planet where even the most benign-looking creatures can be potentially dangerous. But even scientists were surprised to find that this creature was more than just a sponge. Now, this might seem obvious, but the harp sponge got its name because its basic structure, referred to as a vein, is the same shape as a harp. Each vein is made up of a horizontal branch, supporting several parallel vertical branches. But don't let the harp sponge's fanciful and amusing appearance or its non-intimidating name fool you. Yeah, the harp sponge is very much a deep-sea hunter. It has a unique ability to capture and envelop small animals using its rhizoids, short, thin fibers. With their help, the harp sponge clings on to the soft, muddy bottom and catches tiny creatures that get swept into its branches by deep-sea currents. Uh-oh. Other sponge creatures often feed by pulling bacteria and bits of organic matter from the seawater and filtering them through their bodies. But not our harp sponge. Mm -mm. Instead, it snatches its future meal with minuscule barbed hooks that cover each of the harp sponge's branches. Now, harp sponges prefer tiny crustaceans, like crabs, crayfish, shrimps, and prawns. Once the harp sponge has one of them in its clutches, it envelops the animal in a thin membrane before slowly beginning to digest it. So, pal, what's eating you? Oh, harpo? Too bad. Researchers believe that harp sponges use this method of feeding because there aren't enough nutrients that deep down. This makes traditional filter feeding less effective. Research has shown that the creature is still in the process of evolving. Early harp sponges researchers found only had two veins. But later, scientists discovered other harp sponges that had six veins. The harp sponge might have evolved this elaborate candle holder-like structure to increase its surface area. In general, harp sponges typically grow up to a length of one foot. But researchers have seen a creature that was two feet in length. The harp sponge is not wow. only very unusual but also beautiful to look at. See those tiny white balls on top of the branches? Now, why don't we look at some other creatures that live below the photic zone of Earth's oceans? The photic zone means the area beneath the ocean's surface that still receives some sunlight. Thanks to this, there are loads of different creatures and organisms living there. Any animal living beyond this layer qualifies as a deep-sea creature. The Tomopterus worm is a segmented worm you can find in the twilight zone of the ocean. This is the area that lies between 650 and 3,300 feet beneath the surface. These creatures are often no more than one inch long, but the largest of them can grow up to one foot. While swimming around and feeding, these worms do what researchers describe as an amazing smooth dance. That's because the creatures can swim extremely quickly and maneuver at tight angles with ease. Now, I know most people hear the word worm and think of the common earthworm. So it's quite interesting to know there's a deep sea worm out there that never leaves the water during its entire life. Similarly, most of us try to avoid jellyfish that either rest on the sand or sit on top of the ocean waves. This isn't the case with a chrysota jelly. That's a deep sea creature too. This beautiful jellyfish is mostly ruby red, bright orange, or electric purple. That's what helped researchers realize they had found a new species of jellyfish. The creature grows to a maximum size of 1 inch across. It has tentacles that stretch out in every direction. Now, if you come close to this jellyfish, it'll pull all these tentacles in toward its body before rapidly swimming away to avoid danger. Yes, you are dangerous. The chrysota jelly is extremely rare. You won't see it very often. You might need to borrow that deep-sea diving robot I mentioned earlier. While worms and jellyfish might seem quite harmless, this isn't the case with the Pacific viperfish. Ooh. This creature is equipped with a noticeably big mouth, like me. And the needle-like teeth inside are key to its hunting strategy. Pacific viperfish live at around 5,000 feet below the ocean surface. But they're among those numerous marine animals that migrate each night from the ocean depths toward shallower waters to dine. What's on the menu for dinner tonight? Hmm, lots of small fish and shrimp. The creature can grow up to 12 inches in length. Its two front fangs, which stick up from the fish's bottom jaw past its own eyes, are especially dramatic. 
When the fish unhinges its jaw, its mouth can open wide enough to engulf smaller animals, and the teeth form a cage to prevent an escape. Now, have you ever seen an underwater creature that looks like a strawberry? Trust me, it does exist. Just look at these dots on the strawberry squid. The creature has a big eye and a smaller one. You might think this unconventional pairing would be awkward and uncomfortable, but it's actually the opposite. The big left eye looks upward. It spots shadows cast by other animals in the dimly lit waters above. The eye's tubular shape helps it collect as much light as possible. On the other side of the squid's head, you can see its right eye. It's small and looks downward. This eye searches for flashes of bioluminescence produced by animals lurking in the darker waters below. Now, bioluminescence means the production and emission of light by living organisms. By the way, the squid has a nickname. And no, it's not squiggy, although that's a great one. It's known as the cockeyed squid. This is simply due to the remarkable difference in size between its two eyes. Hmm, I think I like squiggy better. And so it goes. Since light doesn't reach the deep sea, the strawberry squid's body actually looks black. This helps the creature hide from enemies, such as sharks and dolphins. In general, the strawberry squid grows to a length of 5 inches. It typically lives around 3,000 feet below the surface, but floats to shallower waters at night. Now, the feather star is a marine creature without a backbone, but with feather-like arms that radiate from the center of its body. These creatures first appeared around 200 million years ago. Related to sea stars, they look like a flower, but if you approach them, they'll quickly swim away. But not all feather stars can swim. Many species can only crawl along the bottom of the seafloor. Like some of the other deep-sea creatures we've looked at, the feather star can adapt to its surroundings. It has a creepy ability to shed its arms, the same way some lizards can shed their tails. This also helps them escape from their enemies. Feather stars live all across the globe, from the equator to the poles, from the shallow waters on top of reefs to the deep, deep sea. Now, given that we're dealing with mysterious creatures, the name of this one is quite fitting. The swift vampire squid should be the official symbol of life in the deep sea. The animal has a dark red body, huge blue eyes, and a cloak-like web that stretches between its eight arms. This, along with its name, may suggest wow. that the creature is some form of a terrifying hunter. In reality, though, the vampire squid is a soft-bodied, timid creature about the size, shape, and color of a football. It grows to roughly 12 inches in length and lives 3,000 feet below the waves. There's almost no oxygen there, but also relatively few predators. Whew, I think I'll need to decompress from this one. Hello, distinguished guests, and welcome to Aquarium Bright. Here, you will get to see the most dangerous sea and ocean creatures. But don't let what I said mislead you. It's very well possible for you to come across one of these underwater animals during a walk on the beach. So take a look at them carefully now, and you might just avoid a disaster. Is it fish or is it stone? What you're looking at is commonly known as the stonefish but its fancier names include the Dornorn and the Sinancia. If you're into diving and observing the underwater, you might already have come across one without noticing. Its appearance makes it almost impossible to distinguish it from a real stone due to its gray coloration and mottled appearance, especially if you're wearing fogged snorkel goggles. So you better pay attention because otherwise, the consequences can be unfortunate since stonefish are the most venomous fish known. Although some types of stonefishes are known to live in rivers, and most of them are found in coral reefs near the tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans. Their needle-like dorsal fin spines stick up when they're disturbed or threatened and inject the poison they contain. The most common reason why stonefish stings occur is swimmers stepping on them without realizing it. However, you don't need to be in the water to get stung. Since they can survive out of the water for up to 24 hours, you'll have to watch where you step when you're at the beach as well. Those who got stung by stonefish describe their experience to be extremely distressing. Their venom can result in infection, and in some cases, it is known to cause shock and paralysis. It might come as a bit of a shock, but despite its bad reputation, stonefish is edible if it's prepared properly. When the fish is heated, its venom breaks down. 
And if the dorsal fins, which are the main source of its venom, are removed, raw stonefish is served as part of sashimi too. This creature might look like it came out of a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. Say hello to the blue-ringed octopuses. Don't be deceived by their small size, which can range between 5 to 8 inches including their arms, because they're packed with venom to cause great damage to as many as 26 people within minutes. Just like stonefishes, blue-ringed octopuses are found in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia. They typically live on coral reefs and rocky areas of the seafloor. Some may also be found in tide pools, seagrass, and algal beds. Blue-ringed octopuses are not aggressive in nature. When they're not seeking food such as crabs or shrimps, or searching for a mate, they often hide in marine debris, shells, or crevices. It's only if they're provoked, cornered, or handled that they get dangerous to humans. When they're threatened, they turn bright yellow or blue iridescent rings appear all over their body as a warning display towards the potential predators. Their bites usually come unnoticed, so you might not be able to realize you're bitten until it's too late. The venom of a blue-ringed octopus can cause dizziness and loss of senses and motor skills, and ultimately, paralysis. So better try to keep your hands to yourself and back away in a hurry if you see one. Nope, it's not a flower bouquet, so don't try to pick and smell one of those pink tube-like things. What's standing before your eyes is a marine animal called a flower urchin. It may look gorgeous, but don't let the looks deceive you. It was named the most dangerous sea urchin in the 2014 Guinness World Records. Flower urchins inhabit the tropical areas of the Indo-West Pacific and are found among coral reefs, rocks, sand, and seagrass beds at depths of 0 to 295 feet. The most noticeable feature of them is their pedicularia, which are claw-shaped defensive organs that are also found in sea stars. What makes flower urchins differ from any other sea urchin is the fact that their pedicularia is, as the name suggests, flower-like and usually pinkish-white to yellowish-white in color, with a central purple dot. Hidden underneath those flowers, they possess short and blunt spines. Although many sea urchins deliver their venom through such spines, flower urchins deliver their venom through their pedicularia, or flowers. If they're undisturbed, the tips of these flowers are usually expanded into round, cup-like shapes. On their surface, they possess tiny sensors with which they can detect threats. And once they contact such threats, these flowers immediately snap shut and start injecting venom. What's weird is that the little claws of the flowers can sometimes break off from their stalks, stick to the point of contact, and continue injecting venom for hours into whoever touched it. Yeesh! Looks like a giant puddle of melted strawberry ice cream, right? You wish! It's a lion's mane jellyfish, which is also called giant jellyfish, arctic red jellyfish, or hairy jelly. They're known to prefer cool water. That's why they can mostly be found in the Arctic, northern Atlantic, and northern Pacific Oceans. But it's possible to spot them around the British Isles or in the Scandinavian waters too. Lion's mane jellyfish are one of the largest known species of jellyfish. They get their name from their long, flowing hair-like tentacles and can reach lengths up to 10 feet. And although the average bell diameter of a lion's mane jellyfish is around 20 inches, they can sometimes attain a diameter of over 7 feet. The largest lion's mane jellyfish recorded was seen in 1865 off the coast of Massachusetts. It was measured to have tentacles around 125 feet long and a diameter of 7 feet. To help you picture it, this is longer than a blue whale. Lion's mane jellyfish hunt by extending their tentacles outward and creating a trap to catch their food. Since they have around 1,200 stinging tentacles, the fish would have to be extremely lucky to be able to escape them. The sting of a lion's mane jellyfish is usually not life-threatening, but you would still want to avoid swimming into its tentacles because it can be very painful to humans. And if you see one washed up on the beach, better not touch it because it can still deliver a sting long after they've been on the shore. Fun fact, the lion's mane jellyfish appears in the Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Lion's Mane, as a suspect. But don't worry, we won't give you any spoilers. 
the last marine animal you're seeing now is a sea snake. And yes, they are different from eels. There are 69 identified species of sea snakes. Most of them can be found in the tropical and subtropical waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And they have been around for millions of years. To make things easier, scientists have separated all different species of sea snakes into two categories, true sea snakes and sea crates. Whereas true sea snakes spend almost all their time at sea, sea crates can spend some time on land as well. If you see a snake on the beach, you can tell whether it's a land or sea snake by looking at its tail. If it's paddle-like, then that's a sea snake you got there, but make sure to keep your distance in both cases. All sea snakes need to surface regularly to breathe since they have no gills. That's why you can come across one while swimming. If that happens, you better swim away as fast as you can because most sea snakes have more venom than the average cobra or rattlesnake. However, since they only attack if provoked, bites are quite rare. One more cool fact about sea snakes, they are the only reptiles to give birth in the oceans. The majority of sea snakes keep the eggs within themselves and give birth to nearly fully formed snakes while swimming. That's except for the yellow-lipped sea crate though. They come onto land to lay eggs of their little ones. Remember the stonefish from the beginning of our tour? They're hunted by sea snakes. Blame the food chain. You sit up on the bed, put your feet down on the floor, and feel the cold water. You quickly run out of the cabin and find yourself in a long corridor. The water is knee deep. People are putting on life jackets, running toward the stairs. You run after them and find yourself in chaos. Water is everywhere. A woman slips on the stairs and falls. You help her up. People from all sides are pushing you. Everyone is trying to climb the stairs. There's more water behind you. The cabin you've just left is completely flooded. A few more seconds and the water level will rise above your head. Fortunately, everyone manages to get out. The upper deck is breaking. The huge ship is tilted to the side. The sound of breaking wood, the grinding of iron, and the shouts of people mixed with the music played on violins by several musicians. You head for the lifeboats and feel like you're climbing a mountain. There are no lifeboats available but you find a life jacket. The entire bow of the ship has sunk under the water. You're at the very edge of the stern and decide to jump. You wait for the ship to sink deeper into the water so the distance between you and the ocean surface is reduced. You finally jump and find yourself in the icy water. It's 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Not enough to freeze the ocean, but sufficient to turn a puddle on the road into ice. You're having a hard time breathing because of the cold. You watch as one of the most majestic, unsinkable ships in history sinks. In one and a half hours, another liner will arrive and rescue all the survivors. But before that, you have to handle this situation somehow. 90 minutes to survive the night in the icy waters of the Atlantic Ocean, among chaos, screams, and despair. Only one thing can be even worse, sharks. Everyone knows the story of the Titanic, what if the survivors noticed shark fins among the wreckage? Theoretically, it could have happened. Scenario 1. The sounds of the crash and the vibrations in the water could attract great white sharks. They swim in the cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean, where the disaster occurred. They are some of the most dangerous predators on the planet. They're big, fast, strong, and their 300 serrated teeth are sharp as a blade, lined in several rows. And now, you see a few triangular fins sticking out of the water. They quickly circle you and the other people. You grab a floating wooden piece left from the ship to climb on it. The cold temperature shackles your movements, and your hands slip. These sounds attract the sharks. One of the predators stops swimming around and is now heading straight for you. Fear makes your brain shut down and your instincts start working. You try your best to swim away from the shark as fast as possible. Of course, it's useless to run from a fast shark in the water, but you're still trying. Two seconds pass and you feel your heel hitting the shark's nose. The other foot goes into its toothy mouth. You scream, feel the sharp teeth on your leg, and shut your eyes, but nothing happens. After a second, the shark lets you go. Great whites rarely attack humans. If they bite, it's just because they want to test you. The thing is, the shark's favorite food is seal. 
After a light testing bite, the shark understands that you're not a seal. It simply loses interest in you. But if the shark is hungry, then it won't care what kind of animal you are. Those survivors who are safe in the boat have no reason to fear. The great white won't attack them. The predator can push the boat a little, but only to test it. If there's a fridge with steaks on board and someone decides to feed them to the sharks, then problems will begin. Several predators will push the boat until the stakes fall in the water. The shark is swimming away from you. Then, one of the lifeboats picks you up. You're safe. Soon, another liner will arrive, and you'll find yourself in a warm and cozy place. Scenario 2. If the water was warmer, Titanic survivors could encounter bull sharks. You jump into the water from the sinking ship. The water's not so cold. You can easily swim to the nearest floating door. But you notice a tall triangular fin with a dark tip on the top. Unlike the Great Whites, these sharks aren't fast. They seem lazy and slow, as if they aren't interested in you. But you still need to climb the door as quickly as possible. Bull sharks are some of the most aggressive in the world. They deliberately create the illusion of slowness, so their prey relaxes. At the right moment, they become agile and fast. They're called that because of their short, flattened faces, like bulls have and their bodies are strong. These predators like to ram their prey or other sharks with their heads. As soon as you climb the door, the bull shark crashes into it and you fall into the water. Fortunately, there's a lifeboat nearby. People get you on board. Several sharks slam into the boat from all sides. It gets scary, but with your combined efforts, you keep the boat afloat. Soon, Another liner arrives and scares off the predators using its loud signal and the roar of the engine. That unpleasant scenario is, luckily, impossible. Bull sharks swim only in the warm waters of the ocean. But most often, they can be found in fresh springs, river estuaries, and shallow water. That's why they're so often seen by people near beaches. Always read about the place where you're going to swim before diving in the water. The third and most likely scenario you jump into the water, it's icy again, and you're having a hard time moving because of the cold. Your life jacket keeps you on the surface perfectly. The lights of the sinking Titanic light up the water a little, and in the black infinite depth, you notice what looks like a large block of stone. An ancient fish, the most majestic shark in the world, is swimming near you. It's a Greenland shark. They swim even in the Arctic waters, so they're not afraid of the cold temperatures of the North Atlantic. This huge predator is bigger than a car. Each year, its length increases by 0.3 inches. You're lucky to see it, as it's one of the rarest sharks in the world. Fortunately, it has a docile nature and will not attack you. The entire kitchen of the Titanic may be floating in the water and attracting these sharks. They're slow, peaceful, and old. The age of the Greenland shark can reach 400 years. This shark is considered adult 150 years after birth. The one you're currently looking at in 1912 may have witnessed the golden age of pirates with sabers, parrots, and eye patches. Arr! And it's quite possible that the same shark that saw the Titanic disaster is still alive in 2021 and slowly wandering the cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean. In all these scenarios, you manage to escape. But if a shark attacks you in the water and there's no boat nearby, then you still have a chance to survive anyway. The main thing is not to panic. Don't splash or make sudden movements so as not to excite the shark. You're wearing a life jacket, so you don't have to move to stay afloat. Do not swim away from the shark, otherwise it'll think that you're its prey. The shark will be swimming around you, so don't lose sight of it. You can slowly swim away to a boat or wooden boards, anything that you can climb. If you're near the shore, then slowly swim towards it until you reach shallow water. After that, you need to quickly run away. But be careful, the shark can even get you out there, so keep your eyes on it at all times. If the shark still attacks you, then you will have to fight for your life. Weak points of the shark are its eyes and gills. Aim for them with your fists and feet. Hey, we all want to get from point A to point B in the quickest, most direct path possible. Agreed? Good. But if you ever wondered why there's no direct flight from your hometown to your destination, there's a reason. When deciding on a new route, 
airlines have smart analysts who decide what that route will be or if it'll even happen. They got two main questions to answer. How many people want to go there and how much money are passengers willing to pay? Depending on those two factors, airlines can make new routes and drop existing ones. Distance means fuel, and fuel means money. If they're not selling enough tickets to enough passengers going that route, out it goes. So it's not only us passengers wanting to get from A to B the fastest way possible. The airline wants to make it as efficient as it can be, too. Because time is money. By the way, it's always bugged me why people don't want to fly from B to A. It's always A to B. Why? B's a nice place, but you wouldn't want to live there? I don't get it. Anyway, back to the script. Whenever you're going on a road trip, you probably plan your route. You pick the best possible roads, you check how many gas stations, stores, and rest stops will be on the way. Even if you don't do that, airlines certainly do. Because flying is a lot more expensive than driving. Before a flight starts, the crew makes a flight plan. The plan is uploaded to the aircraft's computer and shows the whole route from one city to another. The plane will have to stick to it most of the time. Even though there's actually a whole set of routing possibilities. Because it's good to have a plan B, C, and D when you're moving a large chunk of metal through the sky with hundreds of people on board, Airlines have the main route and backups to use in case of weather conditions or other possible issues. So, the people and the airline want the plane to fly the least time possible. As we know, the shortest way from A to B is a straight line. But when you look at the flight map, it's anything but a straight line. It's more of a rainbow shape across the globe. Why is that? Because showing our 3D Earth on a 2D map tricks your eye. Your plane really is flying in a straight line. Proof? If you take a string and connect, say, LA and Tokyo, you'll see it's as straight as lines get. But compare your string to the lines of latitude running across your globe. There it is, that rainbow. If we look at a live flight tracker, we can see thousands of planes flying at the same time in the same route. I mean, the whole map is covered. Look at them all. Okay. Now, let's take, for example, the US and Europe. Planes from New York, Boston, Chicago, and plenty of other cities all fly to Germany, Spain, Greece, you name it. They're all in the same air at the same time and landing in Europe by morning. Turns out, the air highway is much busier than anyone thought. Imagine it happening on a highway on the ground. So much traffic every single day. But when you're up there in the sky, looking out at the clouds, it feels like your plane is all alone. All these planes use pretty much the same route because it's faster and cheaper. So how is it that thousands of aircraft all basically on the same road don't fly into each other? Well, the difference between the road and the sky is that the road is flat. Up there, thousands of feet above the ground, the space is 3D. So air travel takes perfect advantage of that. But you still have to coordinate all that movement, of course. Air traffic is managed by dispatchers who watch for planes and make sure they don't get closer than 3 miles to each other. Something that helps them do that is flight-level regulations. All westbound flights stay at even-numbered altitudes – 34,000, 36,000 feet, you get it. All eastbound flights are at odd-numbered altitudes – 35,000 and 37,000 feet. Meaning, there's at least a 1,000 feet between planes flying towards each other. Doesn't sound like much when we're talking altitudes of tens of thousands of feet, but that's about the height of the Empire State Building. Some parts of the air have extremely high traffic because so many planes fly there every minute. Whenever an aircraft enters one of these super busy zones, it must follow a very specific route. But even in not-so-crowded zones, there are still thousands of planes. To share the sky safely, each must follow their own route that even has a specific name. And they have plenty of help staying on the right path. There are devices on the ground called fixed navigational aids, or nav aids for short. They send radio signals in the sky that an aircraft can pick up on. You also have waypoints that are simply geographical points on Earth. They're loaded into the GPS systems, and an aircraft must follow them. An airplane's whole route is basically flying from one waypoint to another, all the way to the destination place. 
Now, let's go back to that global flight tracker. Something else you'll notice is that planes mostly avoid flying over the ocean in large bodies of water. The Pacific Ocean in particular. Yes, you see some here and there because people do have to get to Hawaii somehow. But in general, everyone's flying around the Pacific, not over it. That's because it's a route that's preferably avoided. Whenever there's a nice path above the ground an aircraft can follow instead, it'll go for the ground. But that doesn't make any sense because flights over water are smoother. Turbulence is caused from hot air rising from the ground. When there's no ground below you in just vast water, the source disappears and you get a less bumpy fly. Still, flying over land is safer. It just comes down to more possibilities for emergency landing on the ground rather than, well, in the middle of the ocean. And planes that take those transoceanic flights are usually the big kind with four engines. It'd just be too dangerous for the ones with only two engines. Just imagine an engine fails, and that plane would have to rely on the one other engine it has. If possible, just best avoid it. But big ones also prefer to have a safe place to land just in case. Now, show me an airport in the Pacific Ocean. Not many of them, huh? Hence why everyone's flying around it. Another region that planes prefer to avoid is the Himalayas. Again, doesn't mean it never happens, just better not to. The Himalayan mountains are higher than 20,000 feet, with Mount Everest reaching 29,032 feet, just to be precise. Most planes fly at about 30,000 feet, and that's just way too close for comfort. Not to mention the winds are strong there, and mountains make it difficult to maneuver the aircraft. That, and there are almost no radar services in the Himalayas, so the pilot wouldn't be able to communicate with the ground. Also, an emergency landing is only possible on a flat surface. The Himalayan region is the exact opposite of that. Add to that, there's a risk of running out of oxygen in this already dangerous area. An airplane only has enough oxygen to last 20 minutes. Plenty of time for the pilot to lower to at least 10,000 feet to a safer altitude with more oxygen. But the Himalayas make that pretty much impossible because, well, mountains poking up all over the place. You get the picture. Back to our flight tracker map. You'll also notice hardly any planes flying over the poles, except that one up in the Arctic. Hey, what are you doing there? Ah, Dubai, Seattle. Well, it's one of the very few. This route likely got a special approval, navigation system, and a unique set of preparations. The problem here is that the poles interfere with the navigation. Compasses there go berserk and are of no use. The Earth's North Pole has a very strong magnetic field that's constantly changing. The magnetic field moves, making true north different from what pilots see on their devices. If they're just a few degrees off course, it could end up costing them dearly over long distances. That's why very few planes actually fly over the Arctic. And forget about Antarctica, nobody's flying over it. Not that you're not allowed, it's just that almost 70% of Earth's land is in the Northern Hemisphere, and nearly 90% of the world population lives up there. Hey, the more you know. The ocean is home to some of the unique animals in the world and the internet. Yeah, deep in the rough currents and crushing water pressure, giant cables extend from continent to continent in the ocean floor. The internet is a group of networks interconnected to form an extensive network, that is, the internet. Devices that connect to it can send data to other devices. Think of it as many people sitting together, always talking about new things that can be saved and used. It wouldn't be possible to watch this video without the internet. It all began in 1969, when an organization called ARPANET released the first basic functions that resemble the internet by connecting four computers at four different universities in America. The people behind the screens could transmit information and access other files internally and across the universities. During the 90s, the internet started to take shape with the birth of the World Wide Web, or as we know it today, as www. Although it's funny that we don't even write that down anymore when searching for something in a search engine. It paved the way for websites that provide more information than ever before. And then in the early 2000s, broadband was born. For those who didn't witness these times, this is the sound you typically hear. Uh. 
It's definitely not pleasant, but this was the quickest way to go online for the millennials. This groundbreaking invention was later developed in other major universities across the U.S. and was eventually renamed the Internet. So yeah, there is no giant building called the Internet, which employs thousands of people to make sure we get what we need. Instead, the Internet is just a distribution of networking systems that rely on a collective effort from multiple machines and sources to form a significant network. The difference between a computer and the Internet is that a computer needs all the hardware to work. The Internet relies on networks that don't always have to be present to work. So if a bunch of servers crash in one country, that doesn't mean it'll affect the entire world. Some websites might be affected, but if you're halfway across the world, then you shouldn't feel it. Data centers host a lot of information like this video you're watching now and shoot it up to satellites orbiting the Earth. The data centers store the content data in something called an SSD inside a large piece of hardware called a server. It then takes that data and transmits it to the device you're using to watch this video. But this isn't good and causes a lot of latency. So the internet is connected with physical fiber network cables that go everywhere and anywhere. There are almost 750,000 miles of wires that connect the continents. Many companies threw their money at underwater cable projects for them to share. Think of it like a complicated highway network that connects cities and towns. The cables are vast clusters of tiny threads of glass fibers that fit together in strands. The people behind these cables in their correct spot spend at least a year planning and structuring the cable highway. The wires are wrapped with a copper enclosure to hold and harness electricity to move data across. They then cover it with plastic, steel, and tar to keep it sturdy against the ocean's conditions. They're strong enough to fend off rock slides, heavy currents, earthquakes, and any other factor that might destroy it. They're strong enough to last for 25 years. Now that the cable is built, it's time to ship it off to sea. They go in with a large ship to deliver the cables. They set it down strategically and adequately so that it doesn't damage the environment and it won't get damaged in the process. Even though we use Wi-Fi to connect to the internet these days, there are still physical cables that connect to internet service providers with special hardware for you to connect to the internet. At first, you need a router. Think of them like traffic control units that help ensure that internet traffic goes to the right networks. So if you're sitting at a restaurant, then you'll most likely connect to the router they provide. Data is transmitted in something like a message through routers whenever you access the internet. Before the data is transmitted, they're broken up into small parts called packets. Before they become messages, the header packet is released so that the receiving device knows what to do with it. They're kind of like instruction manuals when buying furniture or something that needs to be assembled. When the packets arrive at the destination, they reassemble and become the initially transferred data. Sometimes you can't deliver a significant item in one bulk, so the factory disassembles it and transports it via trucks or ships. And once it arrives at the destination, they fix it until it becomes the structure that was initially planned. While this takes months to do, transporting data through fiber cables only takes split seconds to do depending on the project. While all this seems straightforward, there are still protocols to consider. Think of protocols as systems or rules of communication when two or more things connect. When going to a job interview, you wouldn't casually address the hiring manager with a first name and sit in such a rude manner. Instead, the protocols for a job interview are being professional and behaving like a decent human being. Computers in the internet have protocols that they abide by to transmit data easily. So now that you've got your internet, you're ready to surf the web with ease. Every device is appointed a unique IP address to connect to the internet. IP address stands for Internet Protocol and acts as a home address for your device when accessing the internet. When ordering a package to your house, you jot down everything in your home address, starting from your country, city, town, building, street, floor, and so on. An IP address is given to you by your internet service provider on every device you have connected to the internet. An IP address isn't a secret for them. You can easily find it in your device's settings. Even websites stored in data centers have IP addresses. They're just given names like YouTube.com for people to remember instead of a sequence of numbers. You're sitting in front of your laptop and typing a website you want to access. You're requesting a DNS or a domain name server that filters through the website's name and provides the website's IP address. Your browser will forward that IP address to the server inside the data center. Once it receives the OK from the servers, it will transmit the data through optical fiber cables. The journey for data to travel is challenging and goes through rough terrains like mountains and under the oceans. 
Finally, the data arrives at your city through interlinked cables into your router. If you're using cellular data, that data will be transferred to a cellular tower that emits electromagnetic waves on the internet. It looks like it takes time, but this process lasts for milliseconds. Besides a vast network of cables and complicated names, the internet is structured and organized. You can even consider it a mini digital world with rules and guidelines for it to function. With plenty of cables as highways, the data is just traveling from device to device, knocking on IP addresses as doors to enter. As we mentioned earlier, a DNS is like a phone book. It sees which name you typed in and corresponds to the IP address associated with it. A computer can't read letters as we do, instead, it knows it as a sequence of numbers. The internet has gone a long way since its creation. It's estimated that 500 billion devices with 7.5 billion users will be connected to the internet by 2030. The digital world will be entwined with the real world in the future. There will no longer be any keyboards, a mouse or screens. The virtual world will be so realistic that it'll be difficult to tell the difference between them both. People will wear augmented reality glasses, which will display all the information they need. When wearing them, you'll get to see information popping up in the air as you go. You won't have to bend your neck to stare at your phone as you walk to work. The internet could possibly be downloaded into our heads to not search for any information. It will become very essential for us, just like how water and electricity are around us. We've heard stories about people surviving in the desert, Amazon forest, and uninhabited islands for weeks. Such stories show how tough and resilient people can be. But among these many cases, there is one that can really amaze you. It's the story about a guy who spent three days inside a sunken ship at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. He didn't have oxygen tanks, electricity, communications, or food, but he survived. So, it all happened in 2013 on a tugboat that was moving through the Atlantic waters along the coast of Nigeria. That day, early in the morning, there was a small storm. The tug was pulling a vessel with oil tanks. Then, all of a sudden, a huge wave formed. It crashed into the ship and broke the cable. At 4.30 a.m., the tugboat turned upside down. Its entire deck was underwater, and the ship's hull stuck out from the surface. The boat began to sink slowly. The crew of 12 people were trapped, as they all were in their locked rooms. They had closed the doors in their cabins as a precaution, since there were many pirates in those waters. Because of the locked rooms, they couldn't get out. But one of them, Cook Harrison Okina, was in the bathroom during this time. The bathroom turned over. Harrison fell on the ceiling. All the clothes and toilet shelves fell on his head. He was stunned and didn't understand what was happening. When he heard the screams of the other crew members, he realized that the ship was sinking. Harrison struggled to his feet. Holding onto the walls, he slowly went out of the cabin. The water level rose above his head. Harrison took a deep breath. He intuitively, driven by fear, reached the engineering room. There was a small pocket with air. This space wasn't wholly flooded, since the water didn't get there and the air hadn't come out. Harrison realized that this was the safest place for him at that moment. He had no fresh water and no food. He was in a cold, damp room. The floor was flooded, and Harrison's feet began to freeze. There was almost no chance of survival. The man found a soda bottle inside the room and a life jacket with two flashlights attached to it. By this time, the ship had descended to the bottom of the ocean at a depth of 100 feet. This is about the height of a 10-story building. The ship's hull was squeezed and made a grinding noise due to the pressure of the water. Then, Harrison heard a strange movement outside the door. It was sharks and other fish that were investigating the deck. At this point, Harrison began to lose hope. Lack of food supplies and pressure weren't the main problems. The air pocket was small, which meant there was little oxygen. Every 24 hours, an average person consumes about 350 cubic feet of air, which means Harrison had less than one day left to breathe. But despite this, he lived in such conditions for about 60 hours. This happened thanks to the water. The pressure around the ship was so intense that it compressed the air by about four times. Another problem was the cook's breathing. When we inhale, we absorb oxygen. When we exhale, we release carbon dioxide. 
This substance is dangerous to your health if its concentration in the air is 5%. Harrison slowly filled the room with carbon dioxide, and he couldn't get out. With each hour, it became harder to breathe. But here again, he was lucky. Water absorbs carbon dioxide, and Harrison moved and splashed it in different directions. Thus, unknowingly, he increased the water area and kept the carbon dioxide level below critical. But even here, his dangers were not over. Hypothermia may occur in a dark, cold room. It's a condition when your body temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. You get cold, and your perception of the world gets distorted. You don't understand where you are and what's going on. You may lose your memory and even experience terminal burrowing. This weird behavior occurs during hypothermia when a person tries to find a small shelter, even if they're in a closed room. They can even start digging the cold floor with their bare hands. At the same time, a person quickly freezes and loses consciousness within two hours. Harrison's room was filled from below with icy water. He wouldn't have survived in such conditions if he had stayed on the floor for several hours. But he managed to build a small platform with a mattress. This kept him slightly above the water level. With each passing hour, fear and despair more and more bound the survivor's mind. He couldn't get out for many reasons. One of them was that only a little sunlight passes to such a depth, and Harrison couldn't see it. The soda bottle was almost empty, and the flashlight stopped working. The man found himself in pitch darkness, but his salvation was close. While rescuers were searching for survivors nearby, he was thinking about his family and life. Harrison noticed rays of light through a hole in the wreckage. Divers were examining the seabed. It was the only chance to survive. Harrison came out of the air pocket and swam towards the rescuers. He was making his way through the darkness. The ray of light coming from the diver's flashlight disappeared. Harrison tried blindly to find the diver, but they were at the other end of the deck. His oxygen was running out, so Harrison decided to return. There was almost no air left in his lungs. He began to suffocate, but still got to the rescue room. The main thing was not to despair. It was his only chance for salvation. After catching his breath and replenishing the oxygen supply in his lungs, Harrison made a second attempt. He got out of the room and noticed the diver. He swam towards them with all of his might. The lifeguard didn't see Harrison, so the cook knocked on his neck from behind and grabbed his hand tightly. The diver was initially scared, but he realized a living person was in front of him. Harrison swam to his room and led the lifeguard as his oxygen ran out. You can easily find a recording from the diver's camera on the internet, where the frightened Harrison was in his rescue room during a meeting with the diver. The rescuers gave him an oxygen mask. They didn't believe there was a living person in front of them. Harrison couldn't immediately get to the surface because of the pressure. He spent about 60 hours on the seabed, so he needed to change the pressure level slowly to prevent damage to his health. Therefore, the divers put him in a decompression chamber to gradually reduce the external pressure. Then, when Harrison got out, he saw the stars. The cook thought that he had been at the bottom of the ocean all day. So he was surprised when he found out that he had been underwater for 60 hours. Also, he thought that all the crew members had forgotten about him and left the ship at the beginning. Many years have passed since then, but Harrison still has nightmares about his air room. Sometimes he wakes up in the middle of the night and tells his wife that the bed is sinking and they're now at sea. A similar case occurred in 1991 with scuba diver Michael Proudfoot. He was studying a sunken submarine off the coast of Baja, California. During this dive, he accidentally broke his breathing regulator and deprived himself of oxygen reserves. Michael couldn't get to the surface because he was too deep. He wouldn't have had enough air in his lungs. Fortunately, the diver found an air pocket inside the ship. He swam there and waited for rescuers. For two days, he was underwater in complete darkness. He ate raw sea urchins and drank a small amount of warm water from a found pot. Fortunately, rescuers found him. Michael Proudfoot got out of the trap and stayed alive.
That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.